the Committee on Special Populations. We're looking forward to receiving updates on the Mental Health Program, Recovery Academic Program, RAP, as well as an update on the support uh, being offered to the newcoming students. Uh, I would like to give my colleagues a chance to introduce themselves. So, uh, Vice President. Good morning, everyone. Carla Silvestre, Vice President of the Board. Ms. Smondrowski. Good morning, Rebecca Smondrowski. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions about the informational summary from uh, this September 8th? Any questions? No. No. All right. Then we can uh, go ahead and say that we're accepting that. Uh, we are not accepting uh, live questions, but if those of you who are looking uh, still have questions, um, after this meeting, and I encourage you to contact uh, our staff, and you could email them or email our office. Okay. Now, um, our staff is prepared to present uh, updates regarding mental health facilities or initiatives and the RAP program and how we're supporting newcomers to MCPS. And to get started, we'll go to um, Mr. Everett Davis, who is the Director of School Counseling Services, will begin our first pre presentation. That's not your title, is it? <laughs> no, no ma'am. No, uh, that's, that's Karen's. Right. Okay, that's Dr. Cruz's title. Okay. Acting. Yes, I, and good morning. I, I serve as the Acting Associate Superintendent for yeah. Student Family Support and Engagement. Thank you. Anyhow, they're going to do a, a presentation to update us on the mental health um, initiatives. So thank you, Mr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daka. And good morning, Dr. Daka, Ms. Silvestre, Ms. Mondrowski. Uh, I am honored to represent Student and Family Support and Engagement this morning to share how our team, as stated in the MCPS core purpose, prepares all students to thrive in their future, particularly with a focus around equity for our special populations, including but not limited to our ESOL, special education, and LGBTQ. Our work directly aligns with the DSIP, the well-being support, as well as with Board of Education strategic priority area number two, well-being and family engagement. In addition, our work is in direct alignment with Dr. McKnight's PROSPER, specifically the P, putting students first, and the S, supporting staff to meet student needs. Finally, our work aligns with our Be Well 365 initiative, which focuses on the physical, social, and psychological well-being of all students, all staff, and all schools. During our time together today, you will receive mental health and recovery academic program updates, also known as RAP, as well as a briefing around newcomers. In addition to hearing from a variety of SFSC staff members, we are pleased to be joined by our OTLS colleagues from Curriculum Instructional Programs, as well as by one of our community partners, a student, and one of our parents. Each of the presenters will introduce themselves in turn. Several of the themes that we hope to elevate include but not only our work around the six essentials of Be Well 365, mental emotional health, physical health, wellness, culturally responsive relationship building, but also how we work collaboratively as a team across SFSC as well as across OTLS and across the district. Although they're not all represented here today, I do want to recognize the SFSC leadership team as well as the SFSC staff for their primary role and responsibility and commitment to the bodies of work that you will hear represented today. It does truly take a village. And so before I turn the presentation over for our first topic, our mental health update, I did want to highlight the work of our psychological services team and others who supported our Mental Health Awareness Week. I know our, our board members may remember back in, in November, uh, from November 8th to November the 13th. This week included live virtual events, videos and additional info for our students and our families. And we have received around 15,000 hits on our website as well as almost 80,000 hits uh, on our YouTube. So I just wanna encourage you if you have not already done so to visit our mental health awareness uh, week link on our MCPS homepage uh, for additional information. 
And I'll just close with the, uh, just last night I was fortunate along with several of, of our board members and others in this space uh, to be able to participate in a board meeting last night uh, with uh, student leaders across the district where we were able to discuss the mental health and school climate. And these conversations reminded me of the importance of putting our students first and continuing to engage our students in this conversation as well. So with that, I will turn the presentation over to Dr. Cruz, who will get us started with our mental health update. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, I am Dr. Karen Cruz. I'm the Director of Student Wellbeing and Achievement, and I oversee all of our school counselors as well as the comprehensive school counseling programs that exist in all of our pre-K through 12 schools. Joining me today, we have uh, Ms. Laura Williams, who is a counselor at Walt Whitman High School, and also Dr. Christina Connolly, who is the Director of Psychological Services. Um, oh, do we have we the, slides? the slides? Okay, yes. we can pull yeah. up the slides. Next slide. And next slide. First, we want to uh, begin with a brief video that was created to share information about the role of school counselors here in MCPS. It's just a short one minute video that I'd like to show at this time. If you could please show the video. Oh, no, we're waiting for the video. I don't know whether you need to go say something to someone. Okay. Oh. We can't show the video. We'll go ahead and move on. We'll come back to it. So just so that you know, the video really highlights um, the work that our school counselors do in MCPS and really looking at how our counselors are involved, not just in um, the work specifically with um, individual counseling and group counseling, but all of the work that they do with collaborating with teachers, collaborating with administrators, the work that they're doing each day around attending meetings with 504s and IEP meetings and working with our ESOL students. And so this video really highlights some of that work that our counselors are doing and understanding that our counselors consist of school-based ESOL counselors, resource counselors, and then we also have a unique position in MCPS with our college and career information coordinators who are also a part of the school counseling team. To highlight a few other things that our school counselors do, um, they provide what we call a comprehensive school counseling plan in all of our schools. We've recently started working with the American School Counselor Association. We're actually in our third year of incorporating the American School Counseling Association national model into all of our school counseling programs. This is also a part of the Maryland, school, uh, Maryland State Department of Education, COMAR regulation, which states that all Maryland school counseling programs should have uh, uh, alignment with the American School Counseling Association. So we have been training all of our school counselors on that work. And I see the video is now up. <laughs> we don't have sound. <clears throat> So we don't it have should sound. Be sound right? right? Yes. Try and fix the sound. Okay, so I'll, I'll just keep going. Just keep going. Uh, the other piece that um, our school counselors do is that we support students in their transition from one school to another, which is known as our articulation process. Also understand and support the unique needs of diverse school populations, and we make sure that all of our school counselors have an understanding of what that means in terms of working with students that are ESOL, working with students that are METS, uh, working with our students that have special needs. 
We also, as school counselors, address problems that affect student success in the school setting. And we support the school when there's a crisis in the school community. So we are part of that crisis management support team that helps to support whatever is happening in the school in terms of a crisis. If there's a student death, if there's a staff death, if there is something that's happening in the community that um, has affected that school, the counselors always are a part of that team that helps to support the school community. We also make sure that we are providing information to students and families about school counseling services, academic programs, um, opportunities, community resources. Part of the work that our school counselors do is, is looking at all three domains of what is called the academic, career, and also so, social emotional domains. And our school counseling programs consist of areas in all three of those domains. So just wanted to kind of give you a brief overview of what our school counselors do in MCPS. And unfortunately, when we get the, the video up, we'll be able to show that. And as I said, it's only one minute. Our counselors just help us oh, with schedules, there we go. right? There's a lot more to it than that. For colleges, so yes, the more activities you participate. MCPS school counselors help in a wide variety of ways. They provide academic support, promote social emotional well-being, and help with planning for life after high school. They also speak a variety of languages to meet the needs of all students via email, phone, text message, or video conference. Counselors work with parents as well. I would be happy to set up a parent-teacher meeting. To ensure they're partners in their child's education. Always here for students and families. MCPS School Counselors. All in. Todos unidos. John Batgar. For all students. Lohulu Tamarioch. Para todos los estudiantes. And so as I as I shared, this video just highlights the work um, at a very high level that our school counselors do. And as you can imagine, during the pandemic, the work of the school counselor has increased um, in terms of supporting all of the needs of our students and just dealing with all of the pieces of the pandemic that have ca caused some uh, stress, grief, and loss that our students are dealing with and all of those pieces that we're all familiar with. Um, next slide. So when we talk about special population support, we have many students, as you know, that are enrolled in ESOL. And as of support to our ESOL students, we have several positions that provide counseling and support for our ESOL population. One, we have our ESOL transition counselors. We have approximately 19 ESOL transition counselors. And I know a little bit later in our presentation, Ms. Borovkis will talk more about the ESOL transition counselor position and the additional allocations that have been given for the ESOL transition counselor position. We also have school-based ESOL counselors. There are eight school-based ESOL counselors that are at the high school level. Two of those school-based ESOL counselors are full-time in their schools. The other six school-based ESOL counselors are split between two schools. We also have our psych services um, staff that are hired, and I will let Dr. Connolly share a little bit later about the psych services, but they are hired. Um, we have three bilingual school psychologists, psychology interns that are designed to help support students in their assigned schools and really are helping students with in their actual language. So those psych psychologists that are bilingual are working with students in their native language as well. And then for special education, we have counselors, of course, and psychologists that are providing individual and group counseling services to all of our students that have an IEP. So as you can imagine, during the IEP meetings, oftentimes our, count, our students need um, counseling services and our school psychologists and counselors work very closely to ensure that students are receiving those counseling services as stated in their IEP. We also um, have two additional full-time psychologists that were provided for the autism program for FY 2022. Next slide. 
And now I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Laura Williams, who's going to talk a little bit about creating more time with students and making sure that we are creating more time for mental health and for our mental health providers to provide those supports to students. Ms. Williams. Thank you. Good morning. School counselors are witnessing an increased need for social emotional support among our students in the return to schools this fall. While school counselors are all in for all students, we are experiencing acute challenges in ensuring that we have adequate time to engage in direct counseling and support work with our students and our families. One of the most significant barriers we face in achieving more direct service time with our students are the demands of 504 case management and MCPS school counselors serve as 504 case managers. Here is some informal data demonstrating the impact. An informal survey from 2018 of 40 MCPS counselors demonstrated a range of 5% to 18% of counseling caseloads comprised of 504 plans. Elementary school counselors, 504 caseloads can range as high as 100 students. At the high school level, counselors have caseloads as high as 50 504 plans and counting. We have seen an, a significant uptick in 504 evaluation requests in the fall of 2021 as students have struggled in their return from virtual and hybrid learning. Beyond 504 case management, another challenge we face are the demands of the Advanced Placement AP Testing Program. In MCPS, counseling departments oversee and proctor the AP testing process, which results in counselors being unavailable to students for three to four weeks in May during the AP testing window. We are examining other models to alleviate the 504 case management and AP test administration strains. These ideas include revisiting school counselor responsibilities for the AP testing program, another a short-term goal of looking at the responsibilities of other school and central office staff to support counselors in the paperwork demands of the 504 case management role. This will be discussed in a later slide by Dr. Cruz. A long-term goal of creating new non-counseling staff positions of 504 coordinators who would be shared with schools to take over the 504 case management tasks from counselors. Another long-term goal would be increasing the number of school counselors to reduce caseload size and alleviate 504 and test administration strain. Some recent changes in this area will be addressed by Dr. Cruz in a later slide. The American School Counselor Association recommends a ratio of one counselor for every 250 students. Elementary school counselor um, caseloads vary and can range as high as approximately one counselor to 680 students. Next slide. So I wanted to come and speak to um, some of the obstacles that we have when it comes to supporting our mental health um, of our students um, in our schools. And so just as, just like the teachers, um, we are also struggling with staff that are out on long-term leave and vacancies um, that we have. Um, and so in trying to provide coverage um, to all of our schools um, that do not have a full-time counselor or a psychologist in the building. Um, and that we also know that in working with our outside agencies, that there are long wait lists um, for, um, for students to be able to receive services out in the community as well. Because as we know, there is a shortage of mental health staff in the community that was there prior to COVID. And so, and even now, um, with the increased need of support um, due to the tra traumatic experiences that's happened during this time, that um, it's hard for when we, the schools don't have somebody and then the community also doesn't. And so, and we know that also, in looking at our elementary counselor ratios, they are higher than the recommended one to 250 student ratio recommended by ASCA. And so, with that, and go ahead to the next slide. These are some of the things that we've been working on as a collaborative team um, in order to make sure that um, we are providing support um, to those schools um, that do not have somebody in place. And so um, we do have the, the psychologists and the counselors, um, they have been working together in terms, and including some of the PPWs, in providing mental health support for those schools that have a vacancy or somebody who's out on long-term leave. And I know in my department, you know, there's a lot of COVID babies, we all know. So there's a, there's a lot of folks out on long-term leave. 
And so, um, but they've been working together as a team, especially that student well-being team in the building to see what are the counseling needs that are there? What are the IEP needs? What are um, the assessment needs? Other things, meeting needs that are, that are going on. And we have a system in place for trying to either hire like TPT retirees to come back and support us um, and or also for the staff in, the, in, our, in our district to go and providing coverage support um, to those schools that have need if the building cannot take on all of those responsibilities due to um, the person being on long-term leave. All right, next slide. And so also some mitigating steps that we have um, is that we've been working with um, the JESA, the Jewish Social Service Agency, and trying to provide mental health support and wraparound support for our students and our families in communities that do not have designated mental health support in the community. So like we call them like the mental health deserts. And they're in certain areas of the county, like Burtonsville, Up County, Poolsville, that do not have um, aid, like mental health agencies there to provide the support that's needed. And so with our, we have um, an, we had an RFP process and working with JESA, um, they are now providing support um, to 16 of our schools and coming into the school and also doing it virtually and providing mental health support for those students that are referred for the intensive um, therapeutic services that they are providing. And also, um, as we know, with, there are a lot of students who have experienced loss during this time. And so we still we have a collaborative relationship um, with uh, Caring Matters, and they are providing um, good grief groups um, throughout our schools um, for those and the counselors and the psychologists to make those referrals um, and working with the families once they determine that the student um, has experienced a loss and that they are in need of um, additional therapeutic support and they come to the school and provide um, this type of um, trauma-informed practice um, for our students. Next slide. And so and as we shared, oh, no, good to go. I'll turn it back over to Dr. Cruz, go ahead. Yes, and so um, one of the things that we are very happy about is the additional counselor support that will be provided as a, as a result of the ESSER three grant allocations. And so we will actually have 44 part-time elementary counselor positions. For second semester of this year, in January, we're going to try to fill 12 of those positions. Um, you're probably asking, well, why, why are we only filling 12? We have a serious shortage of school counselors and, and mental health providers, period, even school psychologists. Um, and so we needed to wait until after December in hopes of being able to hire some of the December graduates and then looking at next year for the May graduates and hoping to begin to hire some of them as well. We specifically looked at the schools that had high needs, um, high farm rates, um, and, and various other situations, 504s. We looked at multiple variables to determine which schools would be selected for the, this additional allocation. We wanted to provide 0.5s, half-time counselors, because of course we can provide more service and support to more schools, um, opposed to 1.0. Uh, 16 of uh, the part-time positions will be given to middle school counselors, and 16 will be given to high school counselors. Uh, the 16 at the high school level, just so you know, we are examining and looking at if, whether or not we can add additional school-based ESOL counselor positions, because the school-based ESOL counselors are a part of the school counselor allocation. They are uh, trained school counselors, and so we we pretty much continue to have those school-based ESOL counselors as a part of our allocation. And so we want to make sure that some of these schools, uh, especially the high schools, get that support. In addition to that, we are looking, as Ms. Williams shared, there are concerns around the amount of time that our counselors are spending on 504 processing. 
So we are requesting an additional 1.0 instructional specialist that can help with case, some of the case management paperwork processing, making sure that processes are actually occurring in the schools that make sense, and just providing that support um, that they need in order to uh, complete all of the 504 paperwork and, and case management that's required. As you know, we have most 98% of our school counselors, as Ms. Williams shared, are the actual case managers and also the 504 coordinators in the schools. And so they're, they're needing some support there and we want to have this additional position that could help our office with supporting the schools in that particular area. So with that being said, uh, next slide. We will open it up for discussion at this time. Okay, uh, my, my colleagues, my colleagues may have some questions. I know I do, but go ahead, Ms. Monroe. Great. So thank you very much for this presentation. I want to start off by saying how much I appreciate your honesty in the discussion of um, where we need additional supports and, and addressing some of the issues. Um, I have a lot of questions, but I'm, I'll just start with a few. Um, the review that you're doing um, that you mentioned on, um, on number of, um, sorry, the restructuring, the section 504 case management responsibilities, revisiting school council responsibilities for advanced placement testing and increasing the number of school counts. When, when is all this going to be finished? Like when will we be taking action as opposed to reviewing? Great question. So in terms of the 504 case management, we are currently examining the case uh, loads at all of the schools. We're looking at ways that we can improve processes. Sorry. We can improve processes at all of the schools, and we're currently doing that work now. And then as we share, we have requested the instructional specialist that will also help with that piece. In terms of the advanced placement, um, as Ms. Williams shared, every year high school, and this is even when I was a high school counselor, the high school counselors are a part of the AP testing monitoring and, and actually giving the test and so proctoring the test. So every year, two weeks out of the year, those counselors are taking out of their regular work to proctor, which is taking away time from students being able to get mental health support. At this point, we have not, um, we, we don't have an answer to that, I'll just be honest, um, but we are working closely with um, our, the college board to just look at ways that we can get more staffing and more support and we're just examining ways that we can work around that so that our counselors will have the time that they need to actually work with students. Because as, as we shared before, during, now with the pandemic, the student needs are great. Um, you know, Dr. Connolly mentioned that we are helping in the schools in terms of giving support, the psychologists and counselors. I was at a school just the other day, um, a middle school, where two of the counselors were out. Um, on long-term leave. And so we are doing the best we can to try to examine the situations and then seek ways to, you know, meet the needs however we can. And so to answer your question, the 504 piece, we're, we're in progress. The AP piece is something that we still need to work through and figure out how can we get additional support maybe from College Board or from others to do the proctoring while our counselors are able to um, provide counseling and, and do the work that they need to, to support our students. Do we ever utilize like volunteers even to proctor exams or does that yes. we do? Well, that's good. Um, and I'm hopeful that, I'm very concerned about the fact that we're not just not hiring people because we don't wanna hire people. We can't find enough people to hire. And I appreciate that you say you're gonna, you're making uh, adjusting your timings to base graduations and and hopefully get people. But I, I have to say that I'm still hearing a lot of concerns from people who um, have tried to apply to us and 
are, are struggling. You know, the process is long. I mean, I, I was talking to somebody last week who applied to be a, a substitute back in October and is still waiting to figure out how to get into the system. Um, and so I'm hopeful that we are also continuing to address the issue of what the problems are with getting people to be able to um, get hired when they apply. And, um, and that I, I also just want to comment on the fact that, um, you know, we still, we have staff that need a lot of mental health supports as well as our students. Um, you know, we hear, we hear reports of teachers not being, you know, having a hard time keeping it together and they could use that time as well. And so I just want to make sure that we're respecting and appreciating that aspect of, of where they go and who they can talk to and making sure that they know. And then the last thing I'll say for now and let my colleagues jump in, but um, is the, I, the instructional specialist that you're gonna add, the 1.0, um, I'd like to understand better how that's going to work because I really am struggling at this point in time with adding anyone to central office when we need people in the schools. So how exactly is that position going to affect in a positive way the work that's done in schools and help support alleviate some of the issues that we're hearing in terms of them having too much on their plate? So a couple of things. Um, First, I do want to share that we also in school counseling have an internship program. So we partner with several universities and we have interns that work with us. Uh, we have 100 hour interns, 300 hour and 600 hour interns. Most of those interns end up actually being hired in MCPS. So that's another avenue that we use every year to uh, get more candidates and, and more trained candidates because we know that they've been trained by us and we, we, we do a pretty good job with um, getting them ready for the actual work of becoming a school counselor. The other piece to address your, your uh, question about the instructional specialist position, we are hoping that that person will be, just, just as I shared how just the other day I was at a school all day providing support for a school that had two counselors that were, that were not there. So I was meeting with students. I was actually in there like I was as a school counselor, picking up the ball and doing that work. This instructional specialist position, we are hopeful that they will be able to come into schools and provide that type of support for our schools, especially those that have high numbers of 504 case management and they need that additional support. And so this person would be able to do that at mul with multiple schools um, opposed to, you know, of course the funding that we would need to add a position at all 209 schools would be very difficult. And so this would be a start to help with that 504 case management and to help schools get the support that they need to do the work for all of their students that have 504s. And if I might add, Ms. Monjowski, to that, uh, we have worked very closely with our colleagues in special education. And Dr. Cruz, I know, was a part of those meetings. And, and our, our associate colleague in, in uh, special education who has had experience outside of Montgomery County Public Schools. And so looking at what models have been effective, uh, that's just to give some additional context, part of where the idea came from, given the current challenges, uh, what are some other innovative ideas that we can use to help to navigate the challenges? I very much appreciate that. Yes. <laughs> I think sometimes we try to reinvent the wheel where we don't need to, so following other people's best practices is good. Um, the last thing I just want to say is that it, I was going to bring this up in the um, newcomers conversation, but we've talked about this in years past, um, the concerns over being able to address whether someone has um, a learning pro disability versus them just not understanding the language of what and, and what we're teaching. And we've talked about, I know uh, Ms. Working at Quince Richard had started, did a pilot of teaching a math class in a, in a Spanish to see, you know, how that would affect the grades of the students. And it was remarkable, um, she said. So um, how are we, how are the counselors able to work with 
teachers to help understand whether or not they should be identifying there's a problem in terms of a learning disability versus um, a METS, not, you know, the need for a different type of program. Yes, so I'll address that question. Um, our counselors do something that's called educational management team meetings or collaborative problem solving meetings. So when there is a concern that comes up with a student, there's a whole team that gets together and they meet and they take a look at what are the actual concerns and then they determine what are the supports that are needed for that student. And the supports, of course, can vary. Um, typically, our pupil personnel workers are a part of those meetings, so they're also bringing their resources and their knowledge to the table. And there's, there's really, you know, it, it is exactly what it says, a collaborative problem-solving team meeting. And so that's where we are teaming with teachers. We're talking with teachers about what the specific student might need, and then we're providing them with the resources and the support that's needed in the classroom to give that student specifically, you know, whatever it is that was deemed as the concern to support that student. So that uh, those two things I know are happening at every school. There's usually a day every week that's dedicated for those educational management team meetings and collaborative problem solving team meetings. So it's a regular built in part of the school climate and the, the, the school day. And just really quickly, so a lot of times in those situations, especially when it comes to looking at students, they have a disability, and is language impacting um, their ability to learn, or is it like is it a language issue or is it an academic issue? And so our school psychologists work closely with the teachers. We also have a bilingual assessment team or BAT that comes in and does the special education evaluations for students who speak a language other than English. And so, and we've been receiving a lot of referrals. Like that. I just I was at a meeting with my BAT coordinator today. They had a hundred of them. So it's like, so just this month. So. Um, as we are um, receiving um, the referrals and working with the school-based teams, the EMTs and the IEP teams, that is a part of the process. School psychologists are trained in how to differentiate, is it the language concern or is it the academic concern? And so, and we either conducting the evaluations in the child's native language or if we're using interpreters to support us, um, and working collaboratively with the special education teachers as well, since they do the academic side of the testing, and then we do all the other pieces. And so, um, and working together with that team, to really, that, those are always big conversations and discussions um, at the IEP team table um, and EMTs in order to make sure that, because um, we don't want to refer a student um, who maybe is new to the country, is struggling with the language, and then seeing like, oh, they have a disability. No, it's really language acquisition. And so um, to make sure that we are providing the appropriate interventions and accommodations for students in our schools. Thank you. Ms. Silvestri. Thank you. Um, so I, I thank you for uh, the presentation and certainly um, the uh, hiring difficulties that everyone is facing right now. You've been facing for years, right? I mean, counselors have been difficult to find for a while now, and now even more difficult. Um, our partner at Identity, Diego Uriburo, told me recently, they're not there, they're, you know, so <laughs> it's gonna be very challenging. So your number of 12 seems realistic uh, because it is gonna be a challenge to find them. Um, and um, I think what you're doing makes sense. You know, a counselor is a highly trained employee. I don't think that you need that skill set to administer an AP exam. Uh, I don't know much about 504 plans, but I would guess the same is true. It's a different skill set, not the same uh, skill set that a counselor. So I think it makes sense to take away the duties that you don't need a highly qualified, highly educated employee to do and get other folks that maybe we can bring on, maybe as a temporary uh, basis, all those monitors that we hired uh, last year. Um, I think also that um, um, Mr. Uriburo also mentioned some of the things that they're trying. We can't, they can't, they can't hire bilingual psychologists either. And so they are training community members that have maybe degrees in their home countries in psychology or mental health 
to do groups, so to just kind of like a lower level, less intense uh, service that you don't need a psychologist or a counselor to do, but uh, a, a lower level intervention. So you're still serving the population. We can't sit around and wait for uh, all these graduates to come through. We have to come up with other things that uh, we can still uh, meet the needs of our families and our students, but maybe with a different skill set and a lower level of support. I recognize they're not trained uh, to do what psychologists and counselors do. Um, I know that uh, the, we're going to be rolling out a grow your own model this spring for teachers in MCPS, and uh, I'm glad to hear of your internship program, but I think that we should uh, put a lot of time and effort into encouraging our own MCPS students to go also into counseling and psychology. Uh, I know we have a new dual enrollment program for behavioral health, and so I hope to see that grow. Um, and get them when they graduate, right? The, the idea with this Grow Your Own program this spring is gonna be a signing day. I'm committing to coming back to MCPS to work. Uh, there's gonna be an internship, a paid internship for me while I'm in school. And then when I come back, when I graduate, there's going to be a job for me here at MCPS. I don't know of any student in college right now that can say that. And so I think that um, Helen Nixon is uh, working on that for teachers. And I think we need to uh, ramp up what the great work that you're already doing with uh, that internship program. I did want to um, ask some simple questions about, we talk about psychologists, ESOL counselors, counselors social workers. Um, let's start, I, I just, I, we heard a lot about what the counselor does today. Could you explain for me in just simple terms the role of the psychologist and then the role of the social worker? I know social workers are more of a new position in MCPS, but just trying to understand uh, we, what each of those positions do. No, absolutely. And so, um, and we were, I was uh, talking to a group of students about this recently. The so counselors, psychologists, social workers, like they all are trained in providing individual and group counseling. And so those are things that are in common with the, the three positions. But each of them have other nuances that differentiate them and they're having different roles within the school. So for example, counselors working on the academic, college and career readiness work. Um, that is something very specific to that school counselors um, do within schools. Um, school psychologists are trained in providing um, academic and behavioral consultation and working with staff in terms of what are the interventions that are needing, how do you track the data, um, how do you do your functional behavioral assessments and behavior intervention plans, um, and that is some, and assessments for special education. Um, and 504 plans. That is something, those are very specific things that psychologists receive additional graduate level training in. Social workers, um, they also then have training in working with families, working with community agencies, how to make referrals for additional support, um, and really trying to determine that true wraparound service and how, looking at like the whole systemic picture and how do we pull in the pieces from the community, the pieces within the school, in order to best provide support. And so, and while we all look at and are trained in mental health, um, we all can provide a certain level of support for the mental health needs of our students. But there are, again, there's some specific things that differentiate um, the roles. Um, and so, I hope that was, that was like a really brief explanation. Okay. okay. And then uh, the role, the difference between a counselor and ESOL counselor. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, talk about that. So our um, school-based ESOL counselors are actual uh, trained school counselors. The difference is that they are specifically working with our ESOL students with the um, adjustment of cultural and social emotional adjustments that the students have coming into this country, coming into schools in the United States and helping them with that transition. And so our school-based ESOL counselors are really doing the same sorts of things our school counselors are doing, but they have that unique component of being able to work with that whole acculturation component of working with our ESOL population and MET students. They are, again, our school-based ESOL counselors are only at the high school level. However, our ESOL transition counselors that do very similar work um, are spread out with, in our elementary and middle schools as well. 
So we have both positions. Um, the school-based ESOL counselors, again, they have you know, all of the same training and credentials as a school counselor. Many of our ESOL transition counselors have some of the, that same training. Um, many of them are licensed school uh, social workers as well. So there, there's a, a, a lot of overlap. And that's one of the things I also wanted to share when you asked the question about the psychologist, the social worker, the school counselor. A lot of our work overlaps but then there are specific areas that we have specialties in, in each of those positions. So just, just wanted to share that when we talk about individual counseling, group counseling, all three of those positions can provide that support. However, when, when we're talking about the academic and the career pieces, that's usually gonna be your school counselor that's doing that in addition to the personal social um, and social emotional components of their program. So there's a lot of overlap. So an ESOL counselor has a caseload of ESOL students that they do what counselors typically do with their students? Yes, they have a caseload, but they're also specifically working with the ESOL mm -hmm. students when we're talking about you know, working with trauma, you know, language differences, acculturation, all of those pieces, um, the school-based ESOL counselor is specifically also supporting. Thank you. And I wanted to ask uh, Mrs. Williams, um, could you, you, you all mentioned that 18% of your day or your time is spent on 504s, but could you just give me an idea of what your typical day is like? Absolutely, thank you for that question. Um, so that was 80% um, of a caseload, not a day. But um, I will say, so for example, at Walt Whitman, we have over 250 504 plans, which are managed by eight school counselors. So you can imagine, and that's increasing every month with the number of plans that we're, we're being um, asked to put in place. Um, so on a day that we have 504 meetings, for example, I'm usually unavailable to students for the majority of the day. And then in the week prior, I'm usually unavailable for approximately eight hours or so while I prep paperwork and the legal documents because I have to be in compliance. And that's experienced across the board. And of course, Walt Whitman is a very different school than many other schools in our district, but they are increasing at very different high schools like Northwood High School. They're seeing a huge increase in their 504 plans as well. Um, so it does take up a significant amount of my time where I have to close my door and be unavailable to students in order to meet the legal obligations of the 504 process. I don't know if that answers the full question, but. Uh, so on a, on a day that you're not having to do 504 paperwork, what would your typical day look like? So my typical day would look um, like meeting with students in crisis, um, collaborating with teachers, um, running parent-teacher um, parent conferences, um, I would do scheduling concerns, um, going to IEP meetings, um, all those kinds of pieces. I would say that usually there's some aspect of 504 that's part of every day for, um, at least at our school at this point. As far as fielding questions from parents, intervening with a teacher about implementation of the accommodations, that can kind of go into um, every day, even though it's not a meeting day or a preparation for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Mr. Davis, Dr. Cruz, Ms. Williams, and Dr. Connolly for presenting today. Um, I just wanted to mention Monday night, we had a webcast that was on service, um, on safety and security. And Dr. Connolly spoke in there about all the facets of uh, her department and uh, Dr. Cruz's department working with counselors. And last night, we met with students and I know Mr. Davis was here, I think you were here. The students don't really understand what counselors have to do. And the, I mentioned that we were hiring more, uh, which you've given the numbers for here. And we've needed these people, not just because of COVID. We've always needed these people because counselors are not able to do the things they really would like to do. And we do meet with counselors and psychologists and uh, I think the social workers as well, at once a year at least. And the same things you're talking about are the things that we hear. They cannot do the services that they'd like to do with their students. They can't do the group work. They're not doing the individual work. They're tied up with all the paperwork. You mentioned the legal paperwork. Oh my goodness, that federal government really requires a lot. 
so having more people to share this information so that students can feel more um, more attention uh, from uh, the counselors or the psychologists. Now, the psychologists do testing, educational testing. You first have that management team that does educational testing on mostly on reading, and then if it's referred to the psychologist. How long does it take a psychologist to do that? I mean, just, you know. So it depends on the referral questions and what the evaluation is for. Um, uh, let's say a, probably the most basic psychological assessment may take a day to complete if it's just like um, we're looking at learning difficulties, do they have a learning disability, um, they're doing some basic social emotional screenings and um, the cognitive test because the special ed teacher does the educational. But if it's like I'm looking at behavioral concerns or maybe the student potentially has cognitive delays um, then um, and if they speak a language other than English. Um, it could take them the whole week to complete um, just because of um, the amount of testing that then needs to be done in the visual with the student and in working with the teachers, reviewing their protocols, the family. And a lot of times, especially if you have a family member who speaks a language other than English, when you have the interpreter, you have to go through every question because they may not understand it due to um, changes in the definition based upon the, the, the word. And so our, like our BAT team, when they go and they work with families um, for that speak a language other than English, like they work with the interpreter and it takes over an hour just to go through each and every question to make sure that the interpreter understands what the question means so that the parents can answer it appropriately. And so um, that, that process takes double the amount of time than one in English would do. And so, um, so again, it depends on the, 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 um, the type of evaluation um, what the questions are, what are what's needed um, in order to determine it, especially for like initial evaluation where students just come in versus a reeval where the students are already in special education. Initials take longer. Um, according to the law, you have 60 days to complete an evaluation for an initial evaluation for special ed. Um, you have 90 days for a reevaluation. And so, with, I'm sorry, like laryngitis, I've got no. too many night meetings. Uh, so, um, Agreed. We thank you for it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So with that, that is um, that's a, a synopsis of what happens with the evaluation process and, and the amount of time that it takes to complete it. Yeah, well, I, I wanted you to talk about that because I know how much time it takes even reporting back takes a lot of time. And uh, the whole committee has to understand what it is and then develop a program in the school or say, we can't handle this, it needs to be, uh, there needs to be some other uh, uh, specialists to do this. And I, I know that you mentioned, both of you I think mentioned how hard it is to hire counselors and psychologists. Uh, I think they can do other things that seem to be better than coming to schools. I don't know how that could be possible. Schools are the best. <laughs> but also your suggestion with uh, Mr. Uriburu uh, about having monitors or people come in who can do some of the duties that a counselor doesn't necessarily have to do, I think that's okay. a really good idea. Or even and, uh, test preparation, uh, those kind of monitoring tests, that kind of thing can be somebody else doing that. And I just wanted to mention the webcast again because maybe parents or people in the community would like to see that, but it will be broadcast again on the um, and MCPS station, which is 30, I think, for Verizon. I'm not sure about some of the others, but we can give you that information if you call the office. and. I just also wanted to mention that Dr. Cruz said that she went in to, um, to cover some uh, counselors who were not there. And we often get from parents and from our teachers, well, why don't you people in the central office do something to alleviate what's going on with us? And I was glad to hear that that was the example that you gave because everybody's trying to uh, accommodate the needs and it's, it's not, it's not something that people in the central office don't do. Anyway, um, my question about ESSER, and you probably can't answer it, but it's, it weighs on us. 
that we're hiring these people, 44 and 16 and 16. We'd like to keep them in the budget when the grant runs out. Uh, I'm hoping that we can continue to keep these people on board and not say, well, that's it, the grant's gone and they have to be gone too. So we will be working closely with the superintendent on that. And then you talked about JASA, uh, Jewish Social Services Agency, and you mentioned Poolsville and another school up county on the east side. Thank you. And do the Jewish Social Service people, are they assigned to the schools? They're you know, coming to the schools to work with? Yes, they are assigned um, to the schools um, that they work in. Because one of the criteria was that they could not have like a languages of learning or a school-based health center in the school. And so these are places that do not have other supports. And so, and, and also we looked at the farms rate of the schools and trying to make sure that we're equitably placing them um, in the schools that have some of the highest need first and then kind of work our way back down. Yeah, um, I, I wanted to get that out there because I didn't want people to think they had to come to Rockville to oh. do no, they go and they do it at telehealth as well, virtually. Okay. They provide Especially both. Poolsville, they always ask those questions. You know, they don't have the health services they think they would like to have. All right, I think that's all I have. Anything else? Mm -hmm. um, so when you're reviewing um, the roles and responsibilities of our counselors, um, it's hard to imagine that it was, I think, but I think it was five years ago already. Um, we did a four, we had a, a forum with um, students, you know, strictly with students. Unfortunately, it didn't get recorded, but so much of what was said that day, that afternoon, um, as part of that panel, I am still hearing from students constantly. And one of those issues is, um, why is it that our counselors write college referrals? Um, a lot of students are, cons you know, they don't want to, they either feel like they don't know their counselor, so I'm not sure why they're writing the referral anyways, or they, um, it makes them hesitant sometimes to go and talk to the counselor about something because they are afraid it will be somehow reflected in the uh, referral process. So if there were a way to remove doing, you know, the college uh, paperwork, if you will, from that duty, I feel like that would be really beneficial to students in terms of their security and availability. Plus, it's, you know, one more thing, the, you know, and I know that right now um, with our staffing shortages, it's all hands on deck, but I do hear stories of counselors um, covering specials and things like that. And when I hear from our students that they're on a wait list, to be seen by a counselor, and that counselor's covering an art special or something, I feel like that's unacceptable. Um, and um, we need to figure that something there out. Um, and in terms of, you know, when I was mentioning about even having volunteers, I was thinking in terms of things like interages um, that I, I think could be a really good resource for us. Um, Pre-COVID, I know that they had been looking to expand their participation in Montgomery County schools. Um, you know, they are volunteers, but um, if they are there and they have the time and, and the interest, I think we should be really reaching out and taking advantage of that. Um, and I think for right now, that's it. I think the rest of what I have ties more into the discussion with the newcomers and the ESOL supports and stuff like that. But um, but I do really appreciate, again, the honesty. You know, I would have normally, I had thought maybe it'd be nice to have a student here, but you all have been so honest about the, um, the situation and uh, the circumstances that um, I feel like we, we get it. So, um, but I, I, anything that we can do to help support your work in making this better, um, please, feel free to reach out. Ms. Silvestri? Yeah, I just wanted to um, just say that as we enter the budget review season, um, I think to my question about what each position does, uh, I don't think I'm the only one that's a little confused about the roles of the social worker versus the psychologist versus the ESOL counselor versus the counselor. And so I, a nice graphic or just something to explain to our county council and community mm -hmm. Uh, the roles and why they are needed, and, and of course some of the things that you're doing to free up 
um, the, the time for the counselors to do their work. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Can I just add on to that? That that was that too was one of the things that came up, and we had asked for that several years before COVID. Um, asked for that, and even talked about principals because students don't know what the difference in the roles are or who to go to. That was another thing that came up very loud and clear through our student body um, forums and meetings with the um, student leadership groups. And so we had talked about even like doing an assembly at the beginning of the year. Um, maybe even as part of mental health day that we were gonna try to pursue. Um, not mental health week, but one day where all schools are talking about mental health and you know, and that's the focus for the entire day, doing an introduction um, of who the school counselors are, who the school psychologists are, the, all of the different positions, but and having a, a guide that each school could put on their websites to discuss the different, those are things that we've been waiting on. So, uh, you know, to Ms. Silvestri's point, if we could make sure that that happens, that would be good. All right, um, if, there, if there are no other questions. Dr. Dr. Doc, if, I, if I may, and we'll take that back about the, the infographic. I, I heard that as a, a the area of growth last night with our students as well. Uh, but I just wanted to circle back very quickly before we do move on a couple of comments that, uh, that Ms. Silvestri had made um, around our, we, we talked about the budget, the ESSER, uh, the distinguishing roles and responsibilities, and specifically I wanted to elevate our social workers uh, just to make sure that our board members know and also our community is aware that we are currently looking for, uh, through our ESSER funding, 50 social workers. And again, you, you listen to that number and think 50, wow, but we've had the conversation, I don't want to belabor the point about the labor shortage right now. So what is it that we can do in increments and working very closely with our OHRD, Human Resources and Development, who have been wonderful, by the way, to work with, especially when you heard Dr. Cruz mention the counselors, uh, but just continuing to work with them very closely uh, to build out what that implementation will look like. I just wanted to elevate that that is a, a, a project in the works for us and might very much needed, as I think our conversation has illustrated. Also looking at the pipeline, which I, I think I heard Ms. Silvestre mention, what is it that we're doing to continue to have a pipeline in place? And I also, again, want to elevate the work with OHRD and also working with our university partners. It was just in the meeting yesterday, as a matter of fact, and, and, and had queued up uh, Dr. Cruz as well as Ms. Cow, uh, our coordinator in, in uh, our counseling services, that we will be looking to work with our university partners to ensure that we have a pipeline and that we can continue uh, past our ESTER funding uh, to provide those supports that are very much needed. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to say that most of the school systems around the country do not have all the services that we do provide. And yeah, so some of you understand that, but a lot of people say, well, the counselors have too much to do, but it is shared among some of the others. Not enough. We know that we really need to continue with that. But anyway, thank you for everything that you do. and. Thank you for the report. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're on to the Recovery Academic Program, or RAP. And we'll have, I'd like to welcome Ms. Khadija Barclay. And Ms. Evelyn. Okay, I guess you're saying Mr. Davis, and I want to welcome Evelyn Fame uh, Lobos, and you'll have to introduce yourself, student. I'm Sayla Horton. I was a graduate. I'm a graduate of the MAP program. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Everett. Do you want to start? Is your microphone on? Just make sure. On. Good yeah. morning, everyone. Um, do we want to wait for Ms. Silvestri to return, or do you want me to go ahead and get started? Um, you, better, you better go ahead. Okay, well, good morning. My name is Khadija Barkley, and I serve as a principal on special assignment with Montgomery County Public Schools. 
Um, I have with me Evelyn Cyan Lobos, who is a representative of Shepherd Pratt Health Systems and serves as the program manager for the recovery and academic program. And also we have, she introduced herself, but Sayla Horton, who is a graduate of the recovery and academic program through Montgomery County Public Schools. So we do have some slides. If you could go to the next slide. Thank you so much. So the recovery and academic program, as you know, is for students who exhibit substance use challenges um, throughout the course of their high school career, or in some cases, middle school. And what's ironic about my timing here is you just had a presentation about how counselors work with 504 plans and work with families and, and, and challenges and traumatic situations. But this program is really on the other side of those conversations that happen in schools. So there's a student and or a family. Um, there are some substance use challenges, usually um, focused around attendance, limited attendance, decreased academic performance. And there is some identification that substance use is a part of this challenge. And so, the enrollment in our program requires that the family, the student and the family is committed to the program for recovery um, support and or um, commitment to substance, um, commitment to sobriety. And then from an academic standpoint, there's a commitment to, you know, you going, going to school on a regular basis, coming to the program on a regular basis, and getting the academic support and the recovery support in one place with additional resources that we have through our partnership with Shepherd Health um, Services. So um, the first thing that happens is that there's a, a screening meeting that occurs. And after the screening meeting, we assess the appropriateness of the program. And after the screening meeting, students may decide whether they want to come to the day program and be there during the day rather than going to their home school. Or they could decide that they want to just attend the recovery support in the evening. So there are options. Um, there are 40 slots available for students um, in Montgomery County Public Schools. And after we identify the appropriateness of the program, then we really have to work with the counselor and or the administrator at the school to develop their schedule and also identify whether there are any other individuals that we need to communicate with. Could be a probation officer, could be um, a social worker, other supports that the school has already put in place to support the student and the family and other um, um, therapeutic services that we may need to access through our partnership with Shepherd, um, Shepherd Pratt Health Systems. And then after we do the screening meeting and identify the resources that are needed, we then work with the family for them to come in and do paperwork, an intake meeting with Shepherd, Shepherd Pratt staff, and also we create recovery plan goals and educational goals. And so next slide, please. So that's, that's kind of how the, how the program works in terms of a student moving from a school-based program into our program. And, and many times students come directly from treatment rather than going back to their home school, they'll come directly to our program. So this next slide really talks about um, what happens during the day program and what happens during the evening program. Um, students are enrolled in Edmonton classes, much like um, interim instructional services. And so they are physically with a Chromebook at the, at the, facility, at the school, which is at 640 East Diamond Avenue. But we also have temporary part-time teachers that are there, and so rather than them being you know, in a cubicle by themselves, there's a teacher that sits with them and helps them work through their, um, work through their educational um, graduation requirements. Um, but I do want to pause just for a moment and allow Sayla to share a little bit of her story with you and her experience in the recovery and academic program. Okay, so, so um, I went to 
Clarksburg High School. I started as a freshman in 2017. Uh, I was already dealing with multiple mental health problems prior from maybe elementary school all the way till now. But um, freshman year was okay. I started off fine and then I got into drugs, multiple drugs. And as a high schooler, you try to deal with stress in the best way possible. And for me, that was the best way. And obviously now I know that it is not the best way to be. And um, so I got put in a meeting. I, I heard we, you guys were talking about 504 plans and everything. I, was, I had a 504 plan. I was um, with everyone who usually is in my 504 plan meetings, plus Ms. Khadijah and Evelyn, who are sitting next to me right now. Uh, they um, <laughs> sat down and they gave me an ultimatum. They told me, we can help you if you decide to stay clean and sober and you just com completely just stop. And, you know, me, I was just like, oh. Uh. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was like, you know, I need help. I had, I was a soft, sophomore, I think. This was sophomore year. Mm -hmm. I had failed all of freshman, all of sophomore, and I was still struggling with my mental health. Um, the only class that I can say that I had passed was physical education. I was rarely attending school. If I did go to school, it would be for part of the day. I was constantly in trouble, constantly doing things I was not supposed to be doing, skipping, doing whatever. And I eventually agreed to the program and I went. And, you know, at first I was hesitant because I didn't know anybody there, but I got to know the staff and the students. And we sit and we do Edmentum classes. The teachers are phenomenal. I mean, phenomenal. They helped me through everything. I was in the hospital multiple times throughout this time. So I was still not able to constantly catch up with my classes, constantly stay on track with my work. It was, it was a constant battle, but they never gave up on me. Never, ever. They kept pushing me. They kept telling me to keep fighting, you know, just don't, don't give up on yourself. And I think being in a small group also was really helpful. It wasn't large. A lot of kids, especially with like Substance use also has mental health issues, mm -hmm. big one being anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I know being in schools and doing drugs, that's not a good mix. You get very anxious easily, you freak out about little things, you know, everything becomes a big thing. So being in a small area where you know everyone and everyone is comfortable sharing their feelings, we would have group sessions in between classes where we sit and we all talk. We discuss our feelings and our emotions, our, our days and what we're doing to better our sobriety, to better, to keep on the right path. Um, throughout that time, I again had failed junior year only because of my in and out of the hospital constantly. Um, I was still in the RAP program. Um, in those hospitals, I was at Shepherd Pratt with the system. Um, I could not do online work. You're not allowed to have electronics, computers, anything like that. Um, even though I was still technically enrolled in Clarksburg, I was doing all of my work on Edmentum. So all of my classes were there except for tech. Technology they don't have on Edmentum. You have to go into the school. But um, I did all, I came back and mind you, I had failed freshman, sophomore, and now junior year, and I was in my senior year with only a credit in physical education. These teachers had literally, I was a semester away. I had passed freshman, sophomore, junior year before and graduated with my class thanks to these people. I mean, they had, they saved me pretty much. They, they saved my life. I, I don't know where I would be without them. I'm now at MC. I am majoring in psych and chemistry. <laughs> so yes, there are college students like that. Uh, um, yes, I, I want to be a psychiatrist. I'm on a goal. 
I played volleyball through all four years of high school. I, I did great. They helped me so much. I mean, boosted my confidence, boosted my, my self-esteem, my self-worth with myself. And not only that, like, I realized how smart I could actually be. Like, not every kid can finish all of high school in a semester. So it's kind of like, uh, with the people around you, you know you can do it, you know? I even referred someone to the program who's now in the program, who is also doing well, who is also trying to get himself together, get himself, and I know him personally, so I think he will truly benefit from this program. It is a beautiful program, I promise you. <laughs> it, I, I, it's just, I, I love it, and you, you have access to everything. The staff is all there at all times. I still continuously talk to the staff even afterwards. If I'm struggling with anything, I know I can always talk to them. So it's like a big old happy family now. <laughs> so yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. It's <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. So the next slide would just talk a little bit about our enrollees. Um, thank you. So we have, um, Currently we have seven students enrolled and when you look at this slide, you'll see that the first, um, the first bar are referrals. So of course referrals have gone down over the last three years, um, but I think that was definitely due to COVID and students not necessarily being in school. Um, since November, those referrals have increased. Like in the last week or so, we've gotten four referrals. And so that that's, Good. I think that's a good thing because I think we're now catching up being face to face. Thank you, Sarah. Sorry, I'm a she working to, woman she now. Has. <laughs> she has. Before you go, I just can I just say thank you so much for coming and sharing your story. I am so um, inspired and moved by your courage and um, your ability to stick with it and and work through everything. So congratulations to you and the work that you've done. And I do hope. You're gonna come back and work for MCPS as soon as you as soon as you're eligible. <laughs> I was gonna say internship. We heard last this section. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and last year, and last year we and you see how the gradu, graduates have gone up. So last year we had 13 graduates, of which Sela was one of them, um, and. I just, I just remember that first meeting that she talked about when we were at Clarksburg and all of the adults in that building talked about how smart she is and how much potential she had. And most of the courses that she took were repeating courses. So she had seen all of that information before and maybe she wasn't like literally in the classroom, but she had seen most of the information before and she, she did a great job in terms of completing. But like I said, we've just received about four referrals just in the last week. So something something is happening and I think it, it's, it's spreading by word of mouth. We also have staff who, who's, sole responsibility is promoting the program as well. So I think those efforts are, 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 are paying off at this point. Um, next slide, please. And then in terms of um, the budget, we have most of our, most of our costs are personnel costs. Um, and the personnel costs are, of course, our temporary part-time teachers, um, the Shepherd Pratt recovery specialists, and um, the program director. And then we also have um, administrative support there at the landing. And then some of the operating costs include um, food, promotional and outreach materials, psychoeducational materials, um, staff, conferences, and training. And then I think the largest amount in the operating costs is the rent of the facilities at the landing. And then I think the last thing is the impact of COVID. I think the largest impact, which next slide please, the largest impact would be the reduced referrals, I believe, because our referrals were, were down last year. We didn't receive as many at all, of course, because you know students were at home and they were with their families. And so things that you would see um, normally were not seen, like what attendance at school and things of the like. So the, the, the professional staff weren't able to see what was really going on with the students. 
but of course we had increased health and safety protocols. We have a temperature check right at the main office, at the main entrance. Um, cleaning protocols are still very much <laughs> intact, and um, social distancing. We have three classrooms and. All students initially were in one classroom when we started, and now we have to kind of spread them out. And then increased support for families. Lots of our families um, had food insecurities, and then incre an increased number of therapy refer referrals. Because Sayla was correct that most of our students are do have dual diagnoses. And as much as we want to say, we'll come to this program so that you can finish your graduation requirements, that mental health component is always first. Mm -hmm. And what is really great about this program that many of our families share is having this program as a liaison. So if you're going to treatment, you're not withdrawn from school to go to treatment and then having to come back and have a break in your academic career, that there's continuity of services, which is a, a great part of the program, but it's also, it also takes a lot um, to, to manage all of that. Um, and so I would envision that probably by the end of December or beginning of January, we'll probably have about three or four more enrollees. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. And Evelyn, did you wanna share anything before we open it up for discussion? I don't necessarily have much to add. Um, it's been difficult with um, COVID getting uh, new referrals, but we were able to um, adjust and I just wanted to correct. We have two staff members that are um, on board as um, recovery support specialists and we just split both of those positions. So they both took on outreach, um, an outreach role and they've been really uh, doing a really good job of going out into the schools, going out into the community, going into treatment providers um, and, and hospitals just to kind of broaden um, the network. And we've seen such a huge increase because um, our numbers were low. And so I think that's been really helpful. Um, and we're gonna continue doing that, um, including um, we're doing videos, two video open house, um, sorry, two open house videos that will be available on our website hopefully soon. And that would be the last slide I have, which is, that would be the last slide I have, which is our open house that we um, organized for January 6th from four o'clock until 5.30. It's open to the public, but I'm also going to send invitations to school counselors and um, schools and then any families that are interested as well. So we're just trying to get the word out. I think it's a, I mean, I think it's a, a secret, so to speak. I don't know why it's a secret, but I mean, a lot of it is that families just, it's just difficult to navigate the, the challenge of, of substance use disorder. And we're here to support families and you know, I think it's a great partnership between Montgomery County Public Schools and Shepherd Health Pratt Systems. Great, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, Mr. Davis and Ms. Barclay. So, so nice to see you again. And Evelyn. <laughs> Evelyn was my student at Argyle. Oh, wow. <laughs> Straight <That's> A. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Anyway, um, I just. Uh, I just want to say about the open house, I would love to come. I don't know whether we can work it out because we have a retreat that day, but maybe we can work it in just to stop by. But I think it's really worthwhile to see how you're doing it, you know, what the physical space is like, and maybe meeting some of the teachers because I know you have some that are really distinguished mm -hmm. and really know very well how to work with students. And I also wanted to mention the referrals. You know, the chart on here says that we have all these referrals, but not that many are enrolled, but they have to, everybody has to understand that if they are not going to be in treatment or finished with treatment, it's just not going to work. Just as you were saying with, is it Thela, is that her name? Mm -hmm. As you were talking with her, you were encouraging her to stay in treatment, uh, and then she could continue with the program. So uh, I just think it's really important, and I know that, um, I met with the parents, uh, a parent group that really wanted to have this. We didn't have it. We didn't have a whole lot of interest at the state level at that time. But we knew that it was important here in Montgomery County and maybe even more important than people know about. 
and uh, several of the parents had lost their children due to uh, drugs. And so this m meant a lot to them that we now have RAP, and uh, I have to congratulate all of you for the kind of work that you're doing there. It's very necessary, and maybe we can expand it some more. Mm -hmm. So I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Yes, thank you so much for this presentation. Um, you all know how passionate I am about this program and how grateful I am uh, to Dr. Navarro um, for working with all of you and, and uh, the staff here at MCPS um, to find such a perfect fitting program for us at the landing. Um, the partnership there is extraordinary and I'm not sure people fully appreciate how critical that aspect is in terms of making the program be successful. Um, I am, was very, we definitely need to address that tech issue, by the way. <laughs> However, that I don't know what the problem is there, but that we need to fix that. Um, I, um, I'm very happy to see that there's an open house. Um, I will be there. I, um, had asked our staff to organize two open houses. I've been having a lot of conversations with judges and uh, law enforcement, the state's attorney's office, um, some uh, school, they used to be school resource officers, now they're community police contacts or something like that, I don't really know. Um, but all of whom, you know, I've, I had suggested maybe doing two open houses so people had some options. Um, and, and all of our elected officials are also going to be invited. Um, so, um, but then, you know, in, ta in thinking about it, you know, probation officers, law firms, um, pediatricians even, stuff like that, we may want to just try and do some... You know, calling because the more people that know about it, the um, the better off. And I had a conversation um, with our new state superintendent about this program as well, and he said he would very much like to come out and and look. So he will also be on notified of the open houses. It's kind of a little short notice right now, but um, hopefully people can come and we'll hopefully be able to schedule at least one more, um, even during the day, so that people can come out and really see the program and talk to some of the students and, and stuff like that as long as the students are comfortable with that. Um, I just, you know, um, <clears throat> again, we didn't talk quite as much about the partnership aspect. Um, I have lost a sister to, to substance abuse and depression and, um, at a, you know, when she was 24 and, um, between that and the situation with my nephew who had severe substance abuse issues and it was a judge actually, he was in jail and the judge went down and said, I heard that you have an opportunity for rehab. So you're at a turning point in your life. You can pick A or you can choose B. <laughs> but, um, and that to her point, you know, saved his life. And um, I think that, um, one of the things, and as we're getting ready to move it, transition into the next topic of discussion, the fact that we've got one place for our students to be able to go to and receive all of the wraparound services that they need and the supports. And Evelyn, I know how, <laughs> I know you're a 24 seven girl. <laughs> and you know, I've heard stories from our students where um, someone will be at a party and one of the other students will see it on face, you know, on social media and contact you and be like, Hey, you might want to reach out. Cause that doesn't look like good, um, potential, you know, there's a potential there for bad behavior, <laughs> bad decision-making, not bad, but bad decision-making. And, um, and you reach out and I just, it's phenomenal all that you all do. And so I'm really grateful for it. Um, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add, um, to the discussion about the work that you do, but I'm always happy to hear and share with the world. Well, I, I think our team, I'm, I'm really grateful to the team that we have right now, that the people that are there are there um, because they care and they wanna make a difference and that is, um, makes all the difference for the students. They, they see that, they feel that, that they're not there for a paycheck. <clears throat> Um, and so recently I've been having a lot of conversations with students that have already finished the program who are now coming back and like 
now what do we do? Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> um, and I have a, a whole group of students that we're, we're trying to figure out what we can do because um, they're all over 18 mm -hmm. and they want to come back. <laughs> I'm like, no. <laughs> forward. Um, but, but I love to see that we're able to make that impact because um, I know that my biggest fear is that because our numbers are small, um, that it's hard to see the impact that they're having. Um, but what we do on a daily basis, and, and it's not just, it's not me and it's not Khadija, it's, mm -hmm. it's the teachers and it's our team, it's, it's my, uh, the peer support specialists um, that are having those conversations, that are running those groups with those students, we're, we're saving their lives. Um, and I've had so many of these students lip, like say exactly those words, you saved my life and I wouldn't be here without your program, with your, your team. Um, and I know that our numbers are, are low, but we are making big impacts for those students, mm -hmm. for their lives. Um, and I, I had a parent come in last night, actually, um, and he was like, why don't you have more students? You, this program is amazing, and it's free. <laughs> and I was like, um, I, I think it's stigma. Um, and I think that number one is it, it's stigma, and, and number two, it's that somehow people don't know about the program. Mm -hmm. So we are actively working on outreach, um, but I do know that stigma is something difficult for a lot of parents, and they get to the point where they'd rather have their student out of state in a boarding school treatment facility than to have them um, you know, in a specific recovery you know, mm -hmm. school. But I, I love that once the parents are there and they're getting involved and they see the changes in their students, um, then they are really buying into it and we're having a lot more parent participation as well. Um, we've created parent support groups um, and something that we were having was we have a lot of Spanish speaking families right now um, and the parents asked for specifically uh, English classes and so one of my staff members put together a curriculum from different ones and is now teaching English classes on Friday nights. And um, we have really good parent participation in that as well. So we try to just meet the, the needs of the students and the parents wherever they're at and whatever they need. Um, so and we thank you for your support because we've, we've definitely felt your support and we appreciate it very much. That's amazing. Um, you know, I don't know if this would help with the stigma at all, but I'm not sure that all, um, families or, or people that we'd have that conversation with recognize that their kid student would still walk across the stage with their home school and their class um, upon graduation. So um, they're not missing out on, you know, any of the home school type of uh, we, graduation. We do share that. And a couple of years we, when, of course, when we were open and face to face, we had a, we had our students rather than going, rather than all of them going to their home school homecoming dance, they went to the homecoming dance at Gaithersburg uh -huh. High School because it was in close proximity and some of our staff went with them to the dance and they got a chance to get dressed at our location. I mean, it was just really, really a nice, safe way to still participate in the regular, you know, teenage activities without all the risky behavior. So we yeah, are working on those. Um, options that they can participate in school-based activities as well to also include graduation. Right. And, and we do give our students, uh, they, they all know they can graduate from their home school, um, but like last year specifically, we're like, go to your home school, have your graduation, and they're like, we, we want one from RAP. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a great graduation, by the way. Yeah, we want to graduate from RAP. So much so fun We created photos. our own uh, RAP graduation. We were able to hold it and host families, and it was able to be in person. We were able to create our own diploma. Like, you know, obviously, it's just a representation, a graduation from our program specifically, and um, it was really beautiful to be able to, to have that time with the students. Yeah, they seem to really appreciate that. So I'll let my colleagues jump in. I just also want to just end by saying that I'm glad to have heard that you're allowing students to participate in the program who have referrals from school as opposed to having to come straight out of an actual, you know, uh, recovery, a substance abuse program, you know, as long as they're willing to work with us and the student, I meaning, and the families. I think that we have a much bigger, better chance of impacting more 
you know, more people, more students um, that way. So thank you for doing that, and making that change. Say that sometimes when we do, when we do this, when we conduct the screenings, they may not have gone to treatment previously, but we have made many referrals to treatment, and then they go to treatment, and then when they finish treatment, they come to us. So there's, there's no one size fits all pathway to recovery. It seems like it comes from every angle. That's fabulous, thank you. Ms. Sylvester? Yes, thank you. Um, I, um, I recognize that the pandemic really affected the numbers, but um, this is such a valuable resource that I uh, really want us to work together to um, fill up seats. We have 40 seats. We should have a waiting list. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, and so I think that we should ask, uh, maybe I'll ask the board staff to help me with this. Uh, that uh, for this January 6th open house, there should be a virtual option, especially if there is stigma. Okay. So if I'm worried about my people knowing that my kid needs this, and then I'm gonna physically go to Gaithersburg and be seen, let's give people an opportunity to explore the program from the comfort of their home safely, and then maybe we get them to come in in person. So if we could work with our communications department, uh, Ms. Suskind, to uh, figure out what we can do. I know it's short notice, but come on, somebody can hold up a phone and do Facebook Live or something. I don't know, exactly. but <laughs> I'll do it. I'll we can do better that. than that, I'm sure. But I just think it's a, it's a safer way to introduce people to this program, especially if there is stigma issues. That's definitely doable. I don't think that's... Uh, I think we put in a separate request to the MCPS um, uh, video, um, MC, MCPS TV, mm -hmm. to come in and record a video so that we can create... We have um, a, a storyboard already, and we have the students um, who are going to participate in a virtual, like, open house, um, and that's going to be the video that I was referring to earlier that's going to go on our website. Um, that we're hoping to be able to create the two open house videos, one um, from the perspective of students and the other one from you know the perspective of staff. Thank you. Okay, if there is no more, but thank you so much for everything that you do, and I hope we can hear from you again with even more students. But I know you've got two people that you're saying are going to do some outreach so that uh, they'll principals and community will know that it's happening. So thank you very much. And thank you for your support. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, now we're going to go to uh, Mrs. Ms. Margarita Borges, Acting Director of Student, Family, and School Services, and Dr. Jennifer Norton, Director of the Department of English uh, Learners and Multilingual Education. And if there's anybody else, I see Sonia's back there, though. She does secondary, I think. But anyhow, welcome for being here. Good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning. Um, it's, <laughs> it's such a pleasure to be here with you again today, uh, giving newcomer uh, updates to you all. Um, and uh, we had the pleasure of presenting to the County Council on November 29th. I know many of you were there uh, on that day, and I want to highlight the most salient points um, that we made there here today. Uh, we continue to enroll, uh, next slide please. Thank you. We continue to enroll many newcomers even now and as of December 15th, we have enrolled nearly 2,500 students since July 1st. Historically, the busiest enrollment months of the year have been July through September. However, this year was unusual in that we started to slowly increase in July and August and picked up significantly in September through November. In fact, we enrolled over 500 students in November alone and we have enrolled about 150 students in just the first 10 days of December, with more reaching out to us every day. We are seeing about 75 new students a week through the Welcome Center even now, which we usually have slowed down at this point in previous years. We have welcomed families from Japan, Afghanistan, Brazil, Nigeria, and many other countries. 
Although many of our efforts begin with a focus on the families and unaccompanied minors coming to us from our southern border and processed through the Office of Refugee Resettlement, our initiatives benefit all of our newcomers. With regards to unaccompanied minors, it is important to note that although many of the students were unaccompanied when they entered the country, they were reunited with family once they arrived in Montgomery County and are enrolled by a parent or a family member when they reach out to us. Additional pertinent demographic information presented on November 29th includes about 839 or 36% of the total newcomers are Office of Refugee Resettlement students. There are more male than female students, especially within the Hispanic subgroup designation, but the difference is only about 100 students in all. Almost half of the total number of newcomers have self-identified as Hispanic. The top three countries represented are Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala amongst all newcomers. We are also tracking the school level, uh, elementary, middle, and high, and the English language development level numbers of our total newcomers. About 23% of our newcomers of, are of high school age, and 87% of newcomers are referred to ELD screening. Although many of our newcomers arrive with varying levels of English proficiency, most of our Office of Refugee students arrive with beginning levels of English proficiency, usually level one. At this time, uh, I want to uh, introduce and invite someone who should be in our Zoom room. We've invited a parent to come and speak to you today about enrollment and uh, I will do my best to interpret her statements. She will be uh, speaking to us in Spanish. Her name is Orlimar Andreina Valdez Bermudez. Good morning. Uh, good, good morning. Señora uh, Bermudez, ¿cómo está? Bien. Eh, en este momento me encuentro laborando, pero para mí es un grato placer eh, poderme conectar con ustedes y, y darles a conocer mi experiencia. Gracias. Uh, she says right now she's at work, but it's her greatest pleasure to be here to talk about her experience with us. Puede seguir, señora Bermúdez. Ok. Uh, Como les dije, mi nombre es Orlimar Valdés. Eh, llegué a este país eh, proveniente de Venezuela eh, en el agosto 2018, año 2018. Para ese entonces, mis hijos tenían eh, nue diez a nueve años y siete años. Ellos entraron a, a la escuela eh, elementary, eh, para ese entonces, eh, Turgot Master School, ubicada en, en Gaithebo. Um, la verdad es que fui muy afortunada y me siento muy, muy afortunada porque al llegar acá, la primera preocupación que uno tiene como padre es dónde van a estudiar mis hijos, cómo los voy a insertar en la educación cuando son este, sistemas totalmente diferentes. Obviamente, Eh, yo vengo de un país donde prácticamente ya la educación está destruida, eh, lamento decirlo, pero es, es cierto. Y este, encontrarme con un Señora, sistema nuevo. Disculpe, tengo que traducir. Me da muy perdón. Por favor, no okay. está bien. <laughs> um, I'll do my best. Uh, she is coming from Venezuela and she enrolled in MCPS in August of 2018. She has two children at that time, were seven and nine. Uh, and I believe they enrolled at Thurgood Marshall. And uh, she says that at that time, her biggest worry, her biggest concern is that they feel supported and that they were enrolled. Um, and she went on to say that the education system in Venezuela is practically destroyed. So this was very important to her. Siga, señora Bermúdez. Okay. Um, cuando yo llegué a este país, eh, me encontré con la, uh, con, afortunadamente con unas personas que me ayudaron y este, me dirigieron a, al Centro de Internacional. Eh, ellos eh, me agarraron una cita, me agarraron una cita 
y obviamente ya yo venía preparada con algunos requisitos. Entre esos requisitos tenía, eh, obviamente, los pasaportes de mis hijos, tenía este, eh, de mi país, ya yo había solicitado el récord de estudio de ellos y los había postillado eh, totalmente certificado por el Ministerio de Educación. Eh, también tenía eh, conmigo el, el, eh, el contrato de arrendamiento que ya había hecho mi esposo, porque él llegó primero al país, luego nos reencontramos. Y la experiencia que yo tuve al llegar a ese sitio, eh, primero fue encontrarme con mucha gente que está, con muchas personas, muchas familias que estaban al igual que yo llegando a este país. Eso me hizo sentir... Señora Bermúdez, este, voy a, a traducir. Este, perdón. <laughs> Gracias. Okay. Um, so she said that when she first sought out to enroll her children, she reached out to the international office and she spoke to many uh, staff members who helped her. She had all the documentation she needed to enroll her children, including the school records and the children's passports. And she had a lease um, that was signed by her husband. And she just was, she felt uh, greatly supported and helped by the staff at the international office. Siga, señora Bermúdez. Okay. Um, continuando con mi experiencia, eh, me sentí, me sentí grata porque también tuve la oportunidad de ser entrevistada eh, toda la, eh, junto a mis familiares, a mis hijos y mi esposo. Pudimos entrar todos a la oficina, ser entrevistados por una persona que hablaba español. Y la verdad es que nos hizo sentir en familia porque vimos la completa solidaridad que ella tenía al saber y al conocer el motivo por el cual habíamos llegado a este país y esa persona fue tan grata que se tomó su tiempo para podernos orientar. Este, recuerdo que a mis hijos le hicieron un examen de inglés. Eh, obviamente mis hijos en, en el país de nosotros el, eh, el idioma del inglés no, 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 es, este, no es bien formado, pues no. Y a nosotros nos dieron una completa orientación sobre dónde, qué escuela iban a ir nuestros hijos. Gracias, señora Bermúdez. Voy a traducir. Um, she mentioned that she, at that time, she was able to secure an appointment and come and speak to one of the international office uh, specialists who made them feel at home. She was able to uh, attend the appointment with her entire family, her children and her husband, and the specialist uh, was able to speak to them in Spanish, explain uh, the process and make them feel welcome. Uh, she's going on to explain the orientation that she also received. Siga, señora Bermúdez. Eh, en el momento de la orientación, eh, la verdad es que eh, ellas nos dieron también para hacerle el examen físico a nuestros hijos, eh, las vacunas que ellos requerían. Eh, obviamente vengo de, de, un, de un país donde el sistema de vacunación es totalmente diferente al de acá y a pesar de que mis hijos tenían completo su récord de vacuna en nuestro país, aquí necesitaba el apoyo, eh, el apoyo, el refuerzo, diría yo, de otras vacunas. Eh, gracias a esa, a esa oficina ellos pudieron obtenerla. Yo no tuve la necesidad de ir a otro lado. Este, para ese entonces no contábamos aún, mis hijos no contaban con Medicaid porque ese fue el primer paso que dimos al llegar a, los, a, a este país, ir a esta oficina. Y el hecho de que me lo pudieran asistir ahí y, y ser referidos de una vez para la escuela, para mí eso fue, mira, yo creo que un logro, el primer logro en, en este país, que mis hijos fueran insertados al, al sistema educativo. Eh, obviamente, para, okay. Gracias, disculpe. Um, she mentioned uh, initially that her children underwent the ESOL screening as well, uh, since in Venezuela, Spanish is the primary language. And she went on to say uh, how easy the process was in terms of having it all done in one location, specifically having the clinic in the building and being able to have her children referred right away to the clinic in the building, uh, not worrying about insurance or going to doctors or outside of the process, and to be referred directly to the school for enrollment. 
Siga, señora. Una vez que mis hijos recibieron las vacunas pertinentes, le hicieron el chequeo eh, físico, este, nos refirieron a la escuela y nunca se me va a olvidar que también ellos allí recibieron un bolso escolar con útiles. Eh, tenían cuadernos, lápices, creyones. Eh, eh, para mí eso también fue grato porque de una vez ya ellos... Eh, 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 o sea, yo no tuve que comprar para ese entonces nada para ellos poder ir a su primer día de clase. Eh, eh, uno como inmigrante, yo, yo aún lo valoro y, y se me eriza la piel nada más de poderle contar esto. Este, eh, una de las, una, ya en la escuela, al dirigirnos a la escuela, la tuvo Marshall Elementary School, ya nos estaban esperando, ya, sabíamos, ya sabían ellos que, iba, que íbamos hacia allá. Ellos allí también me proporcionaron información sobre el sistema de alimentación de la escuela para aplicar. Eh, obviamente ya mi esposo era el que trabajaba, aplicamos a, eh, y yo me dediqué a, a buscar todos los recursos que estaban alrededor de mis hijos. Eh, la escuela eh, siempre y hasta el sol de hoy nos ha proporcionado a nosotros cada, eh, información sobre cada uno de los programas que van saliendo. Gracias. Programas Voy a traducir. Okay. Gracias. Gracias. Uh, she also mentioned that at the end of the orientation during the enrollment process, um, and she gets goosebumps remembering uh, how sh the children received backpacks with uh, supplies. And as a newly arrived immigrant, it was um, uh, re she had she felt relief that she didn't have to go uh, purchase those items. And then uh, she's starting to describe her experience once enrolled at the school and how they received her very uh, warmly. And they started by explaining uh, the whole farms process, the, the lunch process. Um, siga, señora Bermúdez. Eh, yo, yo me siento y siento que mi familia fue afortunada por tener un centro de, re, de, de referencia, sí, yo diría que es donde todas, todas las personas que llegan a, a este condado o a Maryland y tienen la intención de, de insertar a sus hijos en el sistema educativo, este, tengan, tengan este acceso, es muy completo, yo lo vi muy completo, muy detallado, muy eh, integrado con, con los... Con, con, el, con el objetivo de las personas que llegan a, a, a este país. Eh, me parece excelente. Yo quisiera acotar también, yo actualmente trabajo en la clínica del pueblo que está ubicada en DC, y yo no sé si es porque no conozco el sistema de acá o porque mi experiencia fue muy grata. Eh, actualmente vienen personas acá a la clínica buscando de insertar a sus hijos en la educación y no tienen un sistema como el que está implantado en, en, en Maryland, en, 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 para, el, para incentivar a las personas en el condado de Montgomery. Este, la verdad es que veo a esas personas este, buscando asistencia para sus hijos para que le coloquen la vacuna, para que le hagan un físico y puedan ser aceptados en las escuelas de DC. Este, Gracias, señor. Que, Disculpe, tengo que traducir y también tenemos no se preocupe. que nos están acabando el tiempo. Um, she went on to say that she just, again, appreciated the, the ease of the process and how everything was centrally located, that that was a huge plus, not having to go to multiple offices or different buildings. And she works in D.C., um, I think, in a clinic, and she's comparing our system to what she understands is the system for enrolling in D.C. and how families struggle to go to multiple locations to be able to enroll. Uh, señora Bermúdez, se nos ha acabado el tiempo, pero no muchas gracias por estar con nosotros hoy. Muchas gracias. Agradezco a ustedes por escucharme. Gracias. Can I ask her a question before she logs off? Señora Bermúdez, ¿tiene un momento, por favor? Sí, cómo no. Eh, muchísimas gracias, señora eh, Valdés. Eh, quería hacerle una pregunta. Gracias por todos sus comentarios. Pero si hay alguna cosa que podríamos mejorar... ¿Cuál sería? I just asked her if there's one thing that we could improve. I, I, I know she had a very positive experience, but we're always looking to improve. Sí, um, bueno, partiendo de que yo no me enteré de, de esto, 
por, por, eh, por medios informáticos como eh, no sé, este, sino fue por que ya una persona que vive acá, un amigo este, actualmente, nos encontró la cita. Este, yo creo que ese fue el primer paso. Yo pienso que eh, lo único es que, a, informar más para, el, para hacerlo como que mm, eh, las personas puedan encontrar este tipo de información en las redes, este, de que pueden asistir o, o para que las personas cuando normalmente hay mucha reunificación familiar, ya sepan a dónde van a acudir, porque ahí lo van a encontrar todo. De verdad que sí. Este, solo, hasta luego. So she said that uh, she found out about the center by word of mouth. Somebody told her that it exists. So that would be one her recommendation is getting it out there more. So it's automatic. People know to go there rather than depending on happening to know someone that happens to know what to do. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias, señora. Que tenga buen día. Buen día. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Thank you. Next slide, please. I'll try to move a little quickly. Um, in order to support the influx of newcomer students, we are in the process of hiring additional staff members who can support the students once they've enrolled in their schools. I'm happy to welcome Oscar Alvarenga, who's in the audience today. He's our newcomer coordinator and has a wealth of experience in this community and working with uh, these families. We have... Um, our newcomer coordinator, or Mr. Alvarenga, will be coordinating with multiple MCPS teams, DHHS, and community partners alongside the new DHHS newcomer coordinator, Tania Alfaro, to support our newcomer families. We are hiring 23 additional ESOL transition counselors. We have hired five ETCs in October and November who speak multiple languages, and an additional five are completing the hiring process this month. Additional hiring efforts will continue in January for the remaining positions. We are also hiring 15 additional parent community coordinators. We have hired 10 in October and November who speak multiple languages and plan to hire the remaining five in January. These positions will focus their efforts in our most impacted schools with social emotional supports for students and parent engagement efforts for caregivers. Next slide, please. We are thrilled uh, to have our newcomer coordinator collaborate with all stakeholders to support newcomers and their families. In addition to collaborating with his fellow DHHS uh, newcomer coordinator, Mr. Alverenga will shadow families during the enrollment process, shadow ETCs and PCCs at priority schools to identify need, attend all newcomer steering committee and subcommittee meetings, and participate in newcomer professional development to build the capacity of school staff. Next slide, please. And now Dr. Norton will speak more about our identified priority schools and academic initiatives that are being implemented to support newcomer students. Thank you. Thank you, good afternoon, board members. Um, as Margarita described, MCPS has been welcoming newcomers at a steady rate throughout the fall. When students enroll at the International Admissions Office, students who are eligible based on their home language survey responses are screened for proficiency in English, and many are identified as English learners or, as we're starting to use the term, emergent multilingual learners. And the grand majority do enter at proficiency levels one or two. Of these students, some are also identified as having limited or interrupted previous education. We use the term SLIFE to refer to these students. More than 500 newcomers have been identified as SLIFE this year. These numbers have continued to grow even since creating these slides. We now have over 50 elementary, uh, previous slide please. We now have over 50 elementary students identified as SLIFE at 31 schools. 104 at middle schools, and 390 at the high school level. What does SLIFE stand for? Students with limited and or interrupted formal education. The middle and high schools listed here have programs for newcomers who have been identified as SLIFE. 
The schools in bold are the schools that are welcoming the highest number of newcomers, including both SLIFE and non-SLIFE. Next slide, please. Secondary students who are identified as SLIFE enroll in the Multidisciplinary Educational Training and Support, or METS, program for up to two years and receive instruction in developing English language proficiency and basic literacy and math skills. And at the elementary level, academic supports are provided in the classroom through a capacity building model, which I'll talk more about in the coming slides. Our department, the Department of English Learners and Multilingual Education in the Office of Curriculum and Instructional Programs, provides deep professional learning for English language development teachers and also collaborates across the content areas to reach math teachers, English language arts teachers, reading specialists, and more. Our goal is for all teachers to be able to provide rigorous integrated content and language instruction and to do so in a way that is responsive to students' languages, cultures, and well-being. Some examples of our professional learning specifically for supporting newcomers who have had interrupted education are a regular professional learning community focused on math and literacy for SLIFE at the elementary level. And at the secondary level, we're launching a professional learning series for teachers who teach METS classes on developing literacy and foundational skills. Next slide, please. At the elementary level, students who have been identified as SLIFE receive English language development services at their school from an ELD teacher, and they receive additional support on top of that from SLIFE coaches. We have six coach positions that County Council approved and have hired for three of them. Um, one is being used at CREA, and we have two active vacancies that we are recruiting for but do not have applicants. The SLIFE coaches have dual roles, one to work with students directly to accelerate their learning and also to coach teachers to build their capacity to teach these students effectively. Um, the coaches model trauma-informed approaches and how to move students forward in certain foundational skills while also teaching grade-level content in language. This requires a lot of skill, and the model that we are using allows for more real-time examples and feedback to help build teachers' capacity. We have also connected the SLIFE coaches with the staff who do family supports and services through Margarita's office, um, to help us build a coordinated approach to referrals and sharing resources. Next slide, please. At the secondary level, in addition to the professional learning I have already described, central office staff work regularly with METS teachers, and we will be holding data review meetings with school teams to review students' progress on key interventions and discuss next steps for instruction, scheduling, and exiting the METS program. Before I move to the next slide, I want to mention the staffing challenges that we are seeing and which I know we are all aware of. Um, with the influx of new students, we do need more English language development teachers. We have requested 19 um, additional teacher positions using federal funds and are awaiting county council approval on that. And we are also requesting 21 additional teachers for FY23. Given our increasing numbers, teachers are stretched thin, and it is critical to have sufficient staffing in order to run robust programming that will move our emergent multilingual learner students forward in their language and academic learning. Um, in addition, the question of starting a newcomer school was raised recently um, at the county council session. And newcomer schools do have a long history in the US, and they vary depending on context, but are generally based on the goal of providing a dedicated space for adolescent students who are brand new to the US and to English and may have interrupted education. These programs are a dedicated, nurturing space 
that aim to support students in the cultural, linguistic, and academic transition to the U.S. and use trauma-informed practices and coordinated socio-emotional supports. These programs can be finite, such as one summer, one semester, or one year. Um, as we consider this for Montgomery County, one of the considerations we are keenly aware of is whether a newcomer school could prevent students from interacting with peers socially and academically and in the general education space, which can mean less speaking and listening um, opportunities in English. And this could potentially slow students' growth and kind of unintentionally segregate students from peers and other opportunities. Another consideration is how to incorporate Spanish language instruction and instruction in other home languages to help boost students' academic progress. Um, in the local area, there are two sites of um, this type of program um, in Prince George's County, two in DC and two in Northern Virginia that we could potentially visit to see more firsthand how do they operate and what is working well. Um, these schools are part of what's called the Internationals Network, and, which is an organization that designs, develops, and supports newcomer schools. So we can also reach out to this organization to find out more about their work and how they support newcomer program design and implementation to help us consider if this might be right for MCPS. We can also address this in the upcoming um, ELD program evaluation that we'll be conducting this year. Next slide, please. Our department will be monitoring growth for students who are emergent multilingual learners and will disaggregate for those who are specifically identified as uh, recently reunited through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. We use selected key interventions and assessments shown on this slide to support language, literacy, and math growth. Students' growth is gonna vary depending on each student's starting point, when they enroll in school, what point in the school year, um, but our aim is ultimately to increase students' lexile levels or quantile performance as indicated by the pr particular measure by the end of the school year. Ideally, they will move into grade level range by the end of the year. Um, in February, after the end of the second quarter, we will analyze the data to identify trends and work with schools on how to use the data to guide instruction. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, internally, uh, Margarita and I are meeting regularly um, with our teams and working to coordinate supports. Um, I will now pass back to Margarita to talk about our education subcommittee work. Thank you. In continuation of our newcomer steering committee work, we will continue to meet in the education subcommittee in collaboration with multiple MCPS offices and staff members such as the SLIFE coaches, newcomer coordinator, and community organizations. Our goals are to coordinate stakeholder collaboration, identify cert service gaps and connect people, resources, and services. Next slide, please. Last but certainly not least, the increased demand for services through the international office in the past five years calls for an increase in staffing and resources in order to provide the highest quality and most efficient level of support possible. It is critical that we reimagine our welcome center. A larger and more welcoming center could accommodate large numbers of international families as they enroll year round. We can also invite county and community partners to provide on-site support as the families complete the enrollment process. Additional specialists, testing assistance, and upgraded technology will ensure that we serve as many families as possible in the most efficient way possible so that we prevent any future delays in enrollment at their home schools. This marks the end of our presentation, and I want to thank you all for the opportunity to present to you today. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Borokes and Dr. Norton. And I'm glad that 
Ms. Londrowski asked Mr. Alvarenga to come to the table because he has certainly worked in the community. And he was one of the first officers in the parents, uh, parents organization for speakers of other languages. And we appreciate all your service. So if there are um, questions or comments, uh, Ms. Londrowski. Um, yep, uh, I just only have a couple of questions and then I'll let uh, Ms. Sylvester jump in there. Um, I'm hearing a lot of concerns with issues of vaccination records and um, progress being delayed or derailed by them, families having to get go somewhere to get vaccines, and, uh, you know, vaccinations and it costing money if they don't have insurance and things like that. And I just, I'm hopeful that we could reach out to Holy Cross for a partnership in doing the free vaccines. I'm glad that you guys are talking about the Prince George's model. I've asked staff um, last couple days ago, whatever, to set up a tour that I'd like to, to um, go and look at it because I feel like that's something that we're putting so many resources here, there, and everywhere, and if we could bring them together and really, similar to the RAP type style program, really support our students in every way needed, I just think it would be a much more, um, a better use of our resources. <laughs> and our, and our, I think, you know, it's great you guys are gonna try and hire so many people, but I don't know how that's gonna go. Um, and, you know, I'm curious, my, you know, transportation is also, uh, you know, very much an issue. Um, two quick questions. Can students be directly enrolled in CREA or do they have to be enrolled into a school and then follow a process to go to CREA? So I'm happy to answer that. A couple of years ago, I believe it was actually 2019, we revisited the enrollment in CREA and my office has been working closely with the CREA program so that we identify students at enrollment and we're really identifying students who are 19 and older with zero credits. We just know they don't have the credits or the age to graduate before they age out. So instead of sending them to their home schools to wait to be identified by a staff member, we do have a process in place for the last two years now where we do reach out to CREA directly and send the family to them to do a follow-up orientation and um, explore the enrollment process there. For students that are younger than 19, uh, 16, 17, 18, and they do have some credits, if we can see on paper that they have a chance to graduate, that's, that's the path that we wanna take first. We want to encourage our students to enroll in their home schools, be part of the community, and uh, attain a high school diploma if they can. Uh, if after a semester or a year there are truancy issues, students need to work, there are so many uh, scenarios that come up with that population, then the schools are free to refer those students to the CREA program, and then the process starts uh, from the school at that point. Okay, That's, I appreciate that clarification. Um, there are the only other thing that I have really, um, well, there's a lot, but before I... <laughs> Turn her over. Um, the con there's a lot of concerns with overcrowding in, in our schools, and I'm just curious how we're making the determination as to who's going where and um, how we're addressing those issues, um, because that to me seems like another area that could really benefit from having a, a full service welcome center um, in one location. <laughs> Uh, just to make sure I understand, you're asking how we determine where the students will be enrolled. Mm -hmm. um, so just like any other student in, in our district, the school is uh, determined by their address. Uh, and now that all schools have ESOL services or ELD services, we don't have to make those type of decisions anymore. But there is a feeder um, process for the students who do qualify for MET services or who are life students at the elementary level. Um, SLIFE students at the elementary level get supports at their home schools, but our secondary students will get bus to a MET site if their home school does not have that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'll think about all that. <laughs> Sylvester? Thank you. Um, just going to the chart with the graph of enrollment. Um, 
What number are we using for tracking these students? I know with county council, there were several numbers thrown around, one about ORR students, then I think your number was everyone since June 1st, and here is everyone from August 2nd. So what's, what's the number that we, is gonna be our baseline so that at the end of the school year, we can say X number of students are still here or we lost this many What's the number? Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a great question, and it can be confusing. So we do follow our fiscal year. Uh, most of the numbers that I report out are from July 1st. And as you know, my office sees all international students, not just those coming through the southern border or through the Office of Refugee Resettlement. So I generally start with the large number of all newcomers, all international students. And then we do drill down at the county council presentation. There were a couple of slides where I drilled down to the OR students. But those numbers are maintained internally because, as you know, we want to protect them and we do not uh, assign a marker or flag them in any way as or students in synergy, where a lot of our reporting and our numbers come from. So uh, internally, we're tracking them and we know who they are and we can identify so that we can work closely with Dr. Norton's office to track them and measure their progress. So what's the number? that we're using? Um, last time I checked, it was 839, but we're seeing 75 students, or students, 839. No, uh, on the wait list. All students that have come through your office that, um, I, I mean, I've, I've asked for data for yes. a third quarter marking period to tell us how many students enrolled, how many students are still in MCPS, attendance and marking period grades, and I don't know if, um, there will be some ESOL assessment data there as well. So I just want to know that request has been given. I know we have an agenda item in March for the full board. What number are we going to be tracking and reporting on at that meeting and future meetings? So. Um Earlier I mentioned that we were at close to 2,500 students, total newcomers. And then of course we have to drill down, not all newcomers qualify for ELD services, so we will drill down to those who are actually receiving uh, English language supports, and then we drill down further for the ones who are SLIFE or METS or off, um, Office of Refugee Resettlement students. And I can break that down further. But our total number of newcomers, since we're seeing families from all over the world, is close to 2,500 and it's probably changed since I checked this morning. Okay, yeah, so I think what I'm interested in are those receiving English language support services, SLIFE and METS. Mm -hmm. so right. Um, I guess you, you're telling me you can't tell me a number because we're still enrolling. Yes, about 75 a week. Okay. Okay. But I think Dr. McKnight had kind of wanted a cutoff of the first marking period so, so that we can say they've been in the school system, they've had a, two full marking periods and this is the progress. Because it's not fair to, to the school system to say, I arrived yesterday, now you're going to report out my... <laughs> So there, maybe we could find out what the number is as, as of the, fir the end of the first marking period and use that number for um, reporting purposes. I don't know if that makes sense. To I, I, can, I, can, I have the, the data in front of me. If, um, we, we do have a, sorry, Damon Monteleone, Assistant Chief of Teaching and Learning in Schools, I directly support the IAE office. One of the upgrades that we made since the beginning of the year was a real-time data dashboard that as the students are enrolled, we can track them. I'm looking at it right now. We track them by week. Um, we can track, we have a, any number of real-time data dashboards. As I'm looking at this, to answer your question, in the fiscal year from July 1, um, as of, looks like, November, let's say November 4th, which is just after the mark, the, this marking period, the week of November 4th, 1,862 students from July 1 till the end of the first marking period. Um, the most recent reporting, we do this by week. We have a, a chart by week. So the most recent reporting on December 9th, uh, last week was 2,293, so close to 2,300. So it looks like we will get up to about that 2,500 mark perhaps by the holiday break. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Does that include, how many, do you know how many students are on the waiting list and those numbers that you just reported, does that include the kids who are on the waiting list or just those who are actively enrolled? 
the, the students that, that I'm speaking of here are the students that have been cleared for enrollment in schools. Okay, so they've exited the, the IAE process and they have been, their paperwork has been moved to the schools for course registration and so forth. And do we know how many students are still waiting? Because we're uh, receiving about 75 students um, on average every week, we have about 80 students who are waiting because we're still working with them on obtaining all the documentation, filling out the forms with them, um, and clearing them over the next few days. I had heard it was like 800. Oh, no. No, we haven't had that number in, in a couple of months. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my second question um, was around ESOL staffing. I know that um, in previous years when we've had waves, the administration had padded staffing at some of the high schools that we know receive a lot of students like the ones that you identified here. I think it was uh, Gaithersburg High School and Watkins Mill. Um, I wonder if you were able to do that this year because of the staffing shortages and um, how you adjust staffing as much as you can now that you know where the students ended up um, so that the students are getting the instruction that they need to make the, out, the, the educational achievement that we want. Uh, so my understanding is that for this school year, there was no um, like reserve of teacher positions held and they were all released to the schools based on the projections that had been made. Um, what we have been doing is looking by school to compare the projected number of um, English learner or emergent multilingual learner students and comparing that to the actual and then updating that regularly. And we now see that there are some schools that are um, over enrolled uh, above what was projected and some that are under. And um, we are in the process of, um, you know, counting on those additional positions that we requested through uh, federal funds and, you know, planning how we can um, allocate them, you know, in, in an equitable way using the data that we have about their current staffing compared to um, enrollment. But do you plan to move some people in the before, be, until you get some more hires? Yeah, so one of the strategies that we're looking at is also seeing, you know, if there are teachers who maybe are at like a 0.5 or 0.6 who, um, are already in the system and then looking at like leveraging existing staff to you to um, put towards the new positions. Thank you. And then you addressed my third question about the international school. Um, I think that you, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages, but uh, I think it's the, these other schools have been doing it for years, so there should be good data in terms of all the questions that you raised in terms of speaking and, and listening, skill development, acculturation. Uh, what are their educational outcomes? They, they've been doing this for decades, and so that we shouldn't have to uh, second guess or, or wonder, is this good for us or not? I think something that's unique to us, although not unique to Prince George's County or Northern Virginia, is that we have the strong Central American population here, maybe so more so than Oakland, California, which was another international school that was highlighted in one of the webinars we attended. But um, yeah, there's plenty of uh, neighboring jurisdictions that are doing this already. So um, you know, I think that we're we continue to try this model of kind of the decentralized. But if it's not giving us the outcomes that we want, then we need to try something different. So I have more questions, but I'll, I'll yield. Did you? No, I don't have any questions. I just thought. Um, it's interesting that all the speakers of other languages are not in Silver Spring, but they are in Gaithersburg. Mm -hmm. So the population has, well, anyhow, it's changed a little bit, but we know that we have great needs and we think that you're doing a super job. And I remember uh, the intake center when it was one office and a few benches in the hallway. So then when they added the wing, um, that was a, a modular piece, and I don't think a lot of people know that. I'm only bringing that up because we do talk about facilities from time to time. 
and we need to really let people know these are actually able to be used and they're, they're pleasant. Uh, so now that I'm so glad that we're uh, continuing to improve there so that parents have a decent place to wait and they're getting services. So we thank you for the presentation. Unless there's more, you have yours. Yeah, I, and I know uh, Ms. Silvestre has a couple more things as well. Um, I, I don't think that I have anything specifically new, but I was trying to be really quick, so I just want to make sure that I was clear in some of my questions slash comments before. Um, that was, I was, it was really nice to hear from um, the parent who went through the process. Clearly a success story. Um, but over on average, for the people who weren't fortunate enough to hear by word of mouth, you know, the things that she did and whatever, how long does it take for a student to go through the whole process, a family to go through the whole process? Uh, yes. Um, right now, with the numbers that we have, it's taking us about a week to 10 days. And again, it depends on the paperwork that the family has um, available to them, because sometimes what is time consuming is us reaching out to families. We have found, especially, and I believe it's pandemic driven, uh, we're finding it especially difficult to communicate with families on a regular basis. They're holding down two and three jobs. And my specialists have sometimes had to make phone calls in the evenings, even on Sunday mornings. So being able to reach the families uh, quickly and helping them get the documentation that they need, that requires time. But a family who shows up with everything completed, um, which is rare, they're usually missing something. Our process is uh, pretty involved. Um, they can clear with us within the week, and then there's the English testing, and then the clinic, so it's a multi-step process. And I think, Ms. Mondrowski, if I may, um, for context sake, that prior to the pandemic, uh, it took an average of two weeks, so I think that's just important to, to note as well. So you're saying it hasn't grown, because I don't feel like the communication concerns are pandemic um, related, frankly, because we have forever had these issues and, and concerns and, and different trying different approaches to, to outreach and meeting people where they are. Um, I just, like, again, I, my concern is when a family shows up that they don't have the necessary records, the extended amount of time that it might take for them to, to uh, let's just use the not having vaccination records. Um, as an example, you know, we've got families then who you're having trouble reaching, so that takes time. Um, if they don't have insurance, the vaccines cost money um, in many, many cases, I'm told, and they don't have, or need, and they need transportation to go get the vaccinations. Are we doing mobile um, vaccine units? Um, you know, what, are, what all are we doing for the families that don't show up with everything to hand to you to say here? Uh, that's a great question. We do have a, a, a number of strategies that we use to make things easier for the family. There are some non-negotiables in terms of documentation. Uh, we need a birth certificate to be able to identify the child and we need a photo ID. Uh, but we have had cases where, for example, the father's not on the birth certificate. That happens more often uh, than you would think. But we have a parent affidavit document that we use, and it's in our record keeper manual. All registrars are aware of it, and so we work with the families to take care of that. The other document that tends to trip our families up a bit is the residency uh, document. They generally don't have a lease. They obviously don't have property tax bills because they're not homeowners yet. So many of them do shared housing. And the, uh, the notarizing of the form can be a barrier, but we have folks in-house that can help with that. And then for families who even that is a struggle because the person they're sharing with won't give up the documentation or the lease, we work very closely with Steve Neff and the people personnel workers who do home visits to verify residency. So we can bypass the entire residency documentation if it's a real barrier and send PPWs out to help us verify residency. Those are just some examples 
examples. With regards to the vaccinations, I haven't heard too much about paying for them because our families all have access to the DHHS clinic that's in our building. Um, and the clinic calls them within a week after clearing with us and they make appointments to get vaccinated right at Rocking Horse. So I'm not aware of uh, them going I think elsewhere. It might be more of a, if they don't have transportation to Rocking Horse and so they're looking for something Got more it. local, that that may end up costing okay. money. So um, again, I don't know the specifics. These are just things that, real concerns that have come to us um, through coordinators and, and not us, but who I'm going to ask to speak next in terms of what it is that you do and how, as we're looking at um, these budgetary discussions, um, what you're seeing in terms of the ease of the process, the, the, because, you know, I guess the bigger picture question I'm having is what are these kids doing while they're waiting to get enrolled? And, you know, it's nothing but a good opportunity for bad decisions and, and, you know, being pulled in directions, um, that we don't want our, our families to be in. So there's where I'm kind of heading with this whole big picture. <laughs> so I don't know if you want to speak to what you do and how you do it. And So I've learned to be careful of what I say <laughs> in, this, in this building. And uh, I think it's still a little premature for me to paint the whole picture um, because I am new and I am, you know, getting, uh, um, uh, learning who and what they're doing. But one of the things I want to say is that uh, I've been in my office uh, maybe seven days now, and I've been able to um, interact with people that are waiting, uh, while parents that are waiting for their students that are being tested. Um, I've gone through the actual line of the students, uh, parents when they first get there, not knowing anything. And I've asked them about their experience and, and just trying to get a feel. And I will say that I'm very proud of where I'm working at. As, as of right now, um, the number one thing that parents tell me is that they made me feel welcomed, which I think is very important because everything else will get done, but how they feel six months from now is going to be stuck with them more than if it took eight days or if it took 12 days to get paperwork done. Um, the other thing that impresses me is that everybody at the office, number one goal is to get these families through the system as quickly as possible, but not sloppy either, right? It's identifying truly where these students need to be in MCPS and then providing those services. Sometimes that does take time longer, you know, than we would want. Um, I know that the staff that I'm working with, none of us, including myself, have any desire to have these kids sit at home any longer than necessary. And that doesn't mean that there isn't things that need to be um, adjusted and that there isn't people that maybe need to be shifted a little bit. Um, I think those things probably are true and are going to happen. It's going to require me, though, to shadow, like Mar uh, Ms. Margarita announced earlier. I'm going to be shadowing, being in the schools, uh, being at different programs, different offices. My counterpart, uh, uh, Tanya, at the Department of Health and Human Services, and I are working directly. I mean, we communicate every day, even though it's only been uh, a week. Um, we've had lots of conversations, making sure that we are on the same page. Um, so I do need to get that bird's eye view um, and, and get in the, uh, in the schools to kind of feel some of this out to be able to truly paint a picture. Um, but I'm super excited, you know, to have this opportunity to be able to be on, on the ground and work with our families. And uh, uh, Margarita knows, I know that uh, our goal is get the students enrolled in, in, with a welcoming process but also support after they're enrolled. Because uh, it doesn't stop once they're enrolled in the school the first day. That's just the beginning of the next chapter. And we have to ensure that our families are well protected and served. Um, so, Well, I appreciate that. And if anything you can do, and also from a central location, in terms of trying to identify whether or not there are special education services required and stuff, that would take a lot of burden off of the schools themselves and the counselors and everything as we just heard about. So thank you for 
for looking at that stuff. Go ahead. Did you want to say something? No. Okay. Um, yeah, I looking back at slide 21, uh, like previous, like the previous discussion about counselors and social workers. I, I also think that there needs to be some kind of graphic or to help explain these positions, like the ESOL transition counselors, the PCCs. I don't know if, if you want to organize it by school. So Gaithersburg has X number of students. And programs. And, and, then, and then all these people that are supporting them more. I, I don't know how to organize it, but uh, uh, the fear is that people will think it's duplicative, which I know it's not because the need is so great. So I think it's important to explain to the community how all of these roles touch students and, and you know, we're strategic, we're not running over each other trying to help students. There's a, there's a, a method here. And we, and we do have a document that I think gets at what you're, you're asking, Ms. Sylvester, which will make sure that we, we uh, amplify that. But it speaks to by school, what are the supports that SFSE provides, uh, as well as community partner supports in, in each of our schools. Um, I wanted to ask about the SLIVE coaches. Um, how do you make the decision between hiring SLIVE coaches versus just hiring English language development teachers? Because you say you need those as well. Uh, those are the bread and butter of the ESOL program. So I'm just curious about how to make that decision and uh, what are the qualifications of a SLIVE coach? Okay, that is a great question because we do have the two vacancies, but we also have to hi want to hire additional teachers. I think, um, and I'll invite Tamara Hewlett to you know, come up and add more detail because she is the ESOL supervisor working directly with the SLIVE coaches. Um, but what I am sensing already is that with three SLIVE coaches only and 31 schools, they are spread thin now um, and we need those additional vacancies filled so that we can, you know, have their supports and capacity building work be as robust as possible. I think for us, we see that this model has a lot of potential to achieve the capacity building that will um, have a, an even bigger impact than having additional teachers at school. So we don't want to kind of give up on those vacancies, um, but we know that we do have this shortage and you know have to address that. It's, it's a little bit more challenging to find people who are qualified to be the slave coach and have that particular skill set and the ability to do the coaching than to find the, the ELD teacher. So we would like to you know, continue to fill both ends of the vacancies, but I'd love to pass to Tamara to add more detail. Uh, Ms. Hewlett, in, in, in your remarks, if you could also point to when the SLIVE coach work happens, given that um, we have a full day and we definitely don't want to be pulling students out of uh, primary instruction. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tamara Hewlett. I am the elementary uh, ELD supervisor. Um, thank you for having me. Um, to address what's different between the SLIFE coaches versus the regular ELD teacher, um, we, we were looking for and are looking for one, teachers with ELD teachers with experience, not only in providing English language development, but a solid understanding of the content as well. And so when we are looking for hiring English language development teachers, e ESOL teachers, um, we, we want people who can provide language development. What's different about the SLIFE coaches is they have experience working uh, with classroom teachers um, coaching, uh, they, they are receiving coaching uh, learning as well to be able to go in because they're not only interfacing with a classroom teacher, they're interfacing with administration, they're uh, interfacing with staff development, reading specialists, because what we're trying to do is show teachers how to bridge, build that bridge for, for the missing content while not um, removing students from the classroom setting and removing them from the grade level expectations. And so it's not either or. We want students to have access to the grade level content and we know there's some missing foundational skills that a bridge has to build. And so this life coach has to be skilled in knowing the standards, uh, the, the content standards, as well as English language development, as well as how to be a coach um, and to work you know, through all those nuances. And so we definitely need those, those life coaches. Um, it's, a, it's a particular 
type of, of teacher. Um, and we have three amazing uh, life coaches right now, and we just are ready to get the others um, as long as um, we uh, can find them. Um, in terms of uh, the life coaches working with the students, they do not pull the students out of the classroom. They go and they embed themselves into the classroom, um, and and their schedules change. So they're, as their caseload grows, they're going from school to school, spending uh, you know uh, time in in each classroom, uh, working with the teachers. They might be planning with a teacher and the team one day and then going in and supporting a student. They might go to, they might have three students in the one school and so they're touching all three students within the day uh, of their uh, support. Um, and so they, you know, no one day looks the same for them. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the beauty of them being able to go and, and triage and provide, you know, specific needs. Um, they also work on professional learning with our team, our English language development uh, central office team. And we partner with our content teams in math and ELA because it's not only about, you know, our SLIFE students, it's not only about English language development, it's not only about adding English, but they have missed content. And so we can't do this work by ourselves. We partner with our math team and our um, ELA team to develop a, a learning for a PLC that we have um, invited the classroom teachers and the staff development teachers and the reading specialists to attend because once this life coach is not in the building, they also still have to continue to teach all of our students. And so how do we build their capacity um, as well as support them on the ground doing that shoulder to shoulder work? Are the life coaches a best practice or is that something that we develop because of the need? So uh, with, with the elementary METS program no, no, no longer in that, um, in, in the form that it was, that, that's the approach. But we didn't just take the, you know, just make it up. Um, based on the, the program review for the METS program, um, there was guidance and recommendation from our Office of Shared Accountability that for SLIFE students, um, just having a, an ELD teacher is not necessarily, um, was not necessarily yielding the results um, that were found for the students who, when we put the, the pause on um, welcoming students into the METS program in 2019 with that influx, the students who went to their home schools, their data and you know the whole child, their data see, showed to be better that they were doing better when they were attending their home school, having uh, language models, having grade level academic content exposure, and a teacher who's uh, certified in that content. And so based on the recommendations from the Office of Shared Accountability and, and you know, not having students really in the pipeline for METS at the point in time, this approach um, was, the life coaches was, you know, kind of supporting um, what the data was showing. So we don't have elementary METS anymore? No, not in, no. That's, and so that's why we needed the, the, the coaches. It's life are only for elementary. It's life coaches are only for elementary. Thank you. Um, let's see what else. Um, you, you said you wanted to uh, see that the students moved to grade level range by the end of the year. That's the goal? For whom? <laughs> I know, we used a little bit of vague language there. Um, it's just hard to have a specific metric knowing that students are starting at very different places. Um, so I think that's kind of why, of course, we want to get students to grade level, right, and do that as quickly as possible. Um, but we don't, we don't actually treat the students as a monolith when we do these data reviews. It's to look at the students really individualized skills where they started and where they are growing. We are you know, working to be able to um, analyze our data so that we can see trends and see, well, just how much growth are students seeing overall across a period of time so that then you know, we can use that to make larger recommendations for instruction and practices, but we are very you know, focused on the student and what has to happen for the student next. Um, you mentioned the ELD audit this year. When can we expect to see that? Uh, 
we should be launching the actual project in the coming new new year. Um, my understanding is that we're just like getting signatures and are very close to starting. Um, and um, because of the feedback that we heard from um, our parent today, I just wondered if there is a plan or a new, uh, new strategy for communications about the International Student Center and the community. What more can we be doing to um, promote it? Uh, yes, uh, part of the strategies that we've uh, been implementing this summer and moving forward is uh, becoming more visible and being able to collaborate with our community partners to share this information. A lot of our families who come, move to the county don't reach out to the school first. They actually make first contact with our community partners. So we're really leveraging um, organizations like Identity and CASA to help speak about enrollment and to start giving them the information they need and um, encourage them to reach out to us. We are also doing interviews uh, and Melissa Rivera is helping us also get the word out. But I see that as something that Tanya and Oscar will be doing too moving forward is how we can reach the community uh, either through churches, through where they shop. Like we're going to get very creative on how we can get the word out even better than we do now. Thank you. Um, and then the, the new Welcome Center location, when can we hear, when will we hear more about that? So that is something that is in the works. We're extremely excited. I don't have a de definitive date uh, to share with you, but we will definitely keep you posted. I know we are currently looking at plans to um, to look at our other partners outside of the system, much like we said with special education. Um, what are the other best practices, so to speak, or programs that are working. Again, I, I don't have a definitive date, but I know aspirationally, this is something that we'd like to begin uh, as we move into the next school year. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. If there are no other I questions. Oh. Yep. Sorry. So a couple follow-ups to what you just said. First of all, with the, um, the Welcome Center, you know, in having uh, conversations um, with the superintendent, staff, and stuff um, in terms of the budgeting stuff. I really, before we invest in a, like a central office welcoming center type of thing, I hope that we're going to very thoroughly investigate um, the international school or whatever you'd want to call it, a welcoming school, whatever it might be, so that we are putting our dollars there before we're, you know, I, I don't want to start something and then say, oh, we should probably have done this and and then have to re. No, Miss, and thank you for that. Miss Borkes and I have had the conversation about not only visiting the, the high school that has been mentioned, but also the uh, international missions offices in other districts as well, yeah. uh, to say that we'll do our, our, our field trip, so to speak, uh, yeah. at, at both locations while we're out and about, so yes. Yeah, because I think a K through 12 program actually would be great, um, uh, whether we use one of our holding facilities or whatever um, in terms of centralizing um, location. But um, I had two quick questions. One is, um, do we have any concerns about the effects of a system-wide shutdown in terms of your processes? No, that's not, not really a conversation that, that we, we have had. Uh, I know our number one priority continues to be, and I wanted to elevate uh, the safety and security of all of our students, and not just um, we took physical safety, but their mental health and well-being. So thinking about how we shorten the process, uh, I was just thinking back to the previous conversation about that two weeks to one and a half or less, as Ms. Borges shared. So our students being at home, naturally, I, I do see it having an impact on them. I, I'm not a medical professional, but yes, just from speaking from the, the three MCPS students that live in, in my own household, <laughs> uh, yes, there is a potential uh, impact. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, as if we're receiving 80 students a week, essentially, you know, even one week is a... Is, is a bigger lift, obviously. Um, and my last question really is, how are we addressing placement of students um, in terms of, you? I already asked about location, and that's based on where they live, you said. But in, are we placing them based on age or based on grade level? Um, 
indicators or, you know, I mean, and if we don't have a one school that can address these type of things, how are we making sure that if someone has a, a third grade reading level and they are 17, that they're not being um, stereotyped or, or, you know, put in with the third graders? Uh, yes, yeah, so the, the grade placement recommendations that uh, my intake specialists make follow a number of criteria. We do look at age. We um, obviously don't want to put a 17-year-old in middle school or anything like that. So we do look, we start with grade placement by age, but we also look at their schooling history. And it also depends on the school system they're coming from. Uh, a common example that I give is the uh, UK school system. Their third grade is really comparable to our second grade. So we're mindful and that's what my specialists are very skilled and trained at doing is being able to look at the school systems that students are coming from and what they're comparable to. So we look at that and we make determinations. Uh, we also involve the family in the discussion. And when there are other um, factors that are influencing our recommendation, we reach out to the principal and to the school and we discuss with them um, what they think would be best. And sometimes we enroll and the school will um, make further determinations and finalize the grade placement. So there is some flexibility on the schools also, because there's only so much we can determine on paper. Um, and then of course, if they qualify for ELD uh, screening, then they will be placed according to ESOL level. Um, and for students who are older with interrupted education, we have the METS program that will meet those needs. Okay. The other piece I would add, yes, um, around uh, credit evaluations also, I know Margarita has worked uh, very closely as well with our team um, within our counseling and also our registrars. I don't know if you want to speak a little bit to that too for our students in the high schools. Sure, absolutely. The, the high school age students that are coming in with uh, transcripts from their countries, uh, we work closely with uh, counselors and registrars to complete those credit evaluations, especially if they're older and they're getting close to being a senior, because we want to make sure they're being scheduled in the appropriate courses. Uh, one thing that we are seeing, of course, this is a challenge that we've faced forever, but uh, the pandemic is uh, making it more challenging for the families to obtain official transcripts for many of their school systems. They're moving more slowly. In some cases, they're closed. Uh, so we're working carefully uh, with those families to try and get those official transcripts in. Okay, because I've heard of students who've come and said that they've already taken this math class and they're not getting credit for it and we're making them retake it or, and you know, I just, I, I worry as I'm sure everyone does that if a student um, doesn't feel, you know, if they're struggling because we're pushing them too fast, too far, or too far, too fast, or if they are bored, you know, all these things that can cause kids to, to go in different directions um, or stop showing up. Um, I just I'm curious how we are addressing those things. So thank you. And just, just a final comment too. Uh, you had mentioned the circle back, Ms. Bondrowski, you've mentioned about special education too. I think it's important, I'd be remiss if I did not say this, uh, with us continuing to work with our colleagues in special education, Ms. Borkase also works with the supervisors for special education for each of the areas. So if there are uh, any IEP special education uh, supports that are needed, that that is also included as a support to our students as well. Mm -hmm. Well. I want to thank uh, all of the presenters this morning. Some of them are not still in the room, but one is. <laughs> and thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Borokes and Ms. Alvaringa, and welcome aboard, and Dr. Norton, and Yordle. Okay, thank you. Um, really appreciate everything you've uh, told us about what's going on with the students, because we know that this is a concern. So thank you very much for, for doing this. And before we leave, uh, I just want everybody who's listening and watching to know that this is recorded and it can be seen on MCPS uh, YouTube channel. And uh, parents may want to do that. And they can also do it in languages. There are captions so that they don't, yeah, but they'll be able to do it other than in English. And uh, anyhow, we thank you very much for uh, the information and we're gonna keep supporting uh, your programs and your resources. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, the next meeting is February the 
February the 10th, 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.